Welcome, Sashin. Thank you so much for welcoming us into your home. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. I really appreciate your being here in my home. And it's especially a pleasure for me to have you as a woman of color to be here with me because it's been a long time in coming that women of color are finally before the camera and being able to speak our piece and being able to be recognized as valid in the industry and being able to be seen by the industry. So I thank you tenfold. I've seen you on television many times. I've admired your tenacity, your intelligence, your beauty, and also your presence on air. And I think it's long overdue. And I've sat in my living room and applauded you many, many times. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that means so much to me, Sasheen. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So we have your remarkable life to talk about today. Tell us about the place where you were born. Well, I wrote about my early beginnings. First of all, I want to say that I have said to myself oftentimes that I never wanted to be bored in life, and I never have been bored in my life. And that is something that I set out to do is never lead a boring life. I like to write. I've always been a writer, as quiet as it's kept. And I don't often share my writing with anyone. I just write for myself. I've kept sort of my own diary throughout the years. So if you pardon me for a second, I'm going to put on my reader's I'm 75 years old now, and I've earned the right to wear these. There we go. Therefore, I would probably read somebody else's life and not my own, you see. But here we go. I usually write very short writings, little vignettes, and uh, I like to capture what I've lived. I, Sashin, was born into an enigmatical situation. Is that how you pronounce this, Jacqueline? Uh, inimical. Inimical. Yes. Uh, I had to write about an inimical situation in one of my writing classes, so I chose to write about mine. My mother was white. My father was Native American Indian. I was conceived in Arizona and born in California in November of 1946, just after World War II. The World War may have been over against the Germans and the Japanese, but the war of poverty, disease, abuse, and racism were just beginning for me. A young, innocent infant fresh from the spirit world, I was half Indian and half savage. From birth, no one ever told me, you were looking awfully Caucasian today. I have been called many things in my life, but never that. My parents were saddle makers and leather stampers and artists. You don't see many horses on the freeways these days, so you know that my parents were trying to earn a meager living in a dying art. One thing I did learn in the saddle business is how to recognize a horse's ass. There are, unfortunately, far too many people who fit into this category. My biological parents were both mentally ill and unable to raise me. I was taken away from my biological parents at age three. I was suffering from tuberculosis of the lungs, child abuse, and neglect. I lived in an oxygen tent at the hospital, which kept me alive. It was my maternal grandparents who came to my rescue and raised me from the depths of hell and despair. I felt complete abandonment and betrayal by my mother and my father, which would live on to paint a distorted picture of life and relationships. 
There was much pain ahead for me on my journey growing up of feeling unwanted and unimportant, unloved, and that nobody cared. A deep sense of longing, a pain, a frozen need for acceptance that would never be satisfied. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Mm. What were your parents' names? My father was named Manuel, and my mother's name was Geraldine. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, was named Gerald. G-E-R-O-L-D. Gerald, the French pronunciation. And uh, my grandmother, who raised me, was Marie. And uh, my mom was German, French, and Dutch. And my great-grandmother was from Holland. And she was very racist. She was anti-Catholic, which my grandfather, Gerald, was Catholic. And my great-grandmother hated Catholics so much that when she came across a group of nuns coming to the front door to raise money for an orphanage, she told them to get off the porch, and she swept the porch off, and she got a pail of Clorox water and mopped it down because they had stepped on the porch. When she encountered me, living with my grandparents, she threatened to thrash me with a hairbrush because not only was I not white, but I was Catholic. And she despised me as just a little girl. I had no reason to know why. And I thought she was joking. And I asked her, why would you do that? Why would you threaten to hit me? And she said, you come one step closer to me and I'll show you why. And I said, you wouldn't do that to me, would you? And she just put her hands on her hips and looked at me in disgust and turned around and walked the other way. There was so much hate in that woman and there was so much love in me as a little girl. It was hard to believe. It was hard to even think about something like that within my own family. As I grew up as a little girl, I, it was just the beginning of encountering racism for me, being called nigger on the school grounds by the white kids, white kids not wanting to play with me because I wasn't white, all sorts of hurtful things, being a loner, not feeling a part of, and there was so much alcoholism on my father's part of the family that I didn't get to know any of my father's family because of the umbrella of alcoholism and genocide. It was really painful growing up, very painful. And um, it led to, as I was growing up, a suicide attempt when I got older and I wrote about that too. In our race of people, unfortunately, we do have the highest rate of suicide in the country. And being a suicide survivor, unfortunately, I do understand why. And I wrote about it. I'd like to share that with you. This just came flowing right out of me. I once tried 
to commit suicide, as there was nowhere to hide. My world was one big, deep, black hole where there was nowhere to go, only feelings of numbness, sadness, and gloom, always anticipating doom, would befall me, hearing voices telling me to do myself in. Without a moment's rest, they did their best to keep me awake with constant insomnia of fear. So frightened I could barely shed a tear. Desperation, a look I wore as I tore at myself, tearing down who I was or what I was about. I wanted out of this place of pain that tortured me inside. There was one, only one answer, suicide. Wow. That's such a difficult place to be in. I want to tell you that I wrote an addendum to this mm. after the fact of surviving suicide and surviving the mental institution that I went to for one year when I did attempt suicide. And I wrote as an addendum after the fact, I could not tell the difference between me and my pain. It was what I was feeling that I wanted dead, but I tried to kill me instead. I went to a mental institution for one year of my young life. At the institution, I met two wonderful people named Sir, uh, Sue and Earl, and they were both uh, doctors at Santa Clara University, and I was in Agnew State Mental Institution in San Jose, California, and I had had this complete nervous breakdown with a suicide attempt. So I was sent to this state institution, which was really a hellhole. Uh, you know, something comparable to uh, the cuckoo's nest. And there I was in a state dress and a pair of tennis shoes. And uh, as a suicide survivor, I mean, it was amazing. Um, that I even survived at all. And Sue and Earl just wanted to be known by their first names. So I uh, volunteered because they were asking for volunteers about who wanted to, to participate in psychodrama. So I did. And it was an amazing experience. I first went into a darkened room, very little light, and everyone there had a black hood on and was in a circle, all except for me. And Sue and Earl led me into this room and sat me down in a chair. And I was so terrified because I had been totally canatonic for two whole months. I could barely even speak. I was afraid of everything. I hadn't spoken. It was hot in the summer and I was wrapped up in a big coat and a state dress. And my eyes opened up wide with fear and I started screaming. And I was totally terrified of all these people in these black hoods. They look like Ku Klux Klan. And I started to run out of this room very quickly and they grabbed me and they pulled me back into the circle. And I started yelling and screaming. And the more I cried, the more I cried and the more I cried the more they grabbed me and held me down in this seat. And Sue 
started to role model and play my mother, and Earl started to role play and play my father and took me back to my very beginnings of when I was very, very, very small, when I was a child and an infant. And I relived everything and sobbed my way through everything from my birth to about age five. What were some of the things that were coming back for you? Do you remember? Yes. I relived my father's violent behavior, my mother being an abused woman. I relived being about two years old and running away from home and being found underneath of a freeway and being found by the police and having to be sent back to my parents where there was more and more violence. My father was deaf and he couldn't hear at all. He and my mother communicated through sign language, but he was not right upstairs. And there was so much violence that went on that it was terrifying for me. And then I remember getting sick and coughing and coughing and living in an uh, under a plastic uh, bag in a hospital um, and, and having tuberculosis and high fevers. And I couldn't communicate with anyone because there was this big tube down my throat that did my breathing for me. And no one could hug me, and I got very claustrophobic. And I just relived all these horrible, horrible memories through psychodrama. And that first time around, when I was living what I considered in a big, black, deep hole, there was no light in there at all. I was totally buried by darkness. I remember when I was crying and screaming through all of this pain that there was a light. There was a light in the black hole, a light in the darkness. And some of the pain was leaving. And I grabbed onto that light with all of my strength that I had in my whole being. And that was the beginning of my sanity. That was the beginning of my climbing out of this deep, black hole, inch by inch by inch, is what felt like an eternity to get up and out, to save my own life, because only I could do that, and no one could do that for me. And that taught me the biggest lesson in my whole life, that never, never, ever, throughout anything that I would ever live through, would I ever suffer that much pain again. Nothing would be as difficult as what I went through there, Jacqueline. Mm. Nothing in my whole life that I would suffer through. That if I could do this, I could do anything. That I could accomplish anything. And nothing in my whole life has been as painful, has been as difficult, has been as challenging as that institution, finding my sanity, and getting out of there. Because some people never did. Some people lost it entirely and never made it out ever and turned out mentally ill for their whole life whole, whole lives. And I saw that as I was in there. And I never knew if I would be one of them. 
And I was diagnosed schizophrenic when I was in the hospital. And I've been in the mental health system ever since then. But I was re-diagnosed many years later when I had an episode. They call them episodes now. And I've been a proponent of mental health and work for mental health all of these years with NAMI, the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill, and given presentations before people, before schools, before institutions, at mental health hospitals, with a group of people who have suffered from mental illness like myself. I am diagnosed correctly as schizoaffective bipolar. And I have been taking medication under psychiatrist for the past 35 years. And I see my psychiatrist once every two weeks, and I take blood tests regularly for my medications, et cetera, et cetera. And I encourage everybody who has a mental health or what we call a brain chemical imbalance to take the medication because they're so sophisticated these days that people can function totally with proper help and get out of denial that anyone doesn't need it because it's like having diabetes. Get on a proper diet, get on some metformin or whatever you need to do, and get with the program. If you have an imbalance anywhere in your life, learn to balance it so that you can function. Period. And move on. Be happy. After all, who is a normie? I don't know any normies. Do you? I certainly do not. Exactly. <laughs> How old were you when you were institutionalized? Oh, my goodness. I believe I was about 19. And before that, I had this terrible dream that my father was coming to knife me to death every single night, and it was a recurring nightmare because I had been so abused growing up that I couldn't tell reality from non-reality. And the dream led me to believe that if I didn't do myself in, that he would do me in during my dream. And that was when I actually did hear voices that were telling me to do myself in. And that was a nightmare within itself. That was a nightmare to live like that and not to know that there was any answers to that at all. And back in those days, which was more than 50 years ago, um, when you didn't really have any choice in medication, at the mental hospital, you got Thorazine. If you didn't like that, you got Thorazine. And if you didn't like that, you got Thorazine. But nowadays, it's not like that at all. There are many different medications for many different uh, diagnoses. They're much more sophisticated, much more uh, 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 tuned in to the particular diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know... It's, it's worth really people investigating. And when I hear that, you know, people are blowing people up with guns, et cetera, et cetera, and they say, oh, this person is mentally ill, you know, people are evil. There are good people and there are evil people. I'm a good person. 
I would never take a gun and hurt anybody. I wouldn't hurt anybody. You know, people live their lives according to uh, your belief system. You know, loving individuals and, and being kind and generous and so forth and so on. What the world needs now, there's a song about it. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. La da 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 la da da da. I don't have a good singing that voice, was beautiful. but you get the point. <laughs> but you know, things are so topsy turvy now. Uh, in in my in 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 my learning experience in life, you have to learn to love yourself first. It's a it's a it's a thing that when you love you. You love other people, and it goes like this. If you don't love you, a New York, forget about it. And that's exactly the way that it is. That's exactly the way it is. Loving families create loving individuals and create loving children to go out there into the world to generate this. And lots of gratitude. Every morning when I get up, I pray. I pray, and I try to love everybody in my life and show them that they are loved, at least by me, that I appreciate them. The love, the gratitude, the prayer, I think that's ultimately important. That if you can do that in life, then you can really do anything. The giving back. You know, it, it's relevant. And forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgive yourself, number one, and forgive everybody else. Instead of carrying grudges. I think that is is ultimate. Because if if I don't forgive people, and I've had a lot of people do rotten things to me, believe me. But I can't carry that. I, I had somebody tell me the most beautiful story. There was a woman who suffered so much in Otsowitz that she was told that she had to forgive this, this guard who shot and tortured all of her family members. And she's told the rabbi, I'm sorry, I can't do this. It's absolutely impossible. I can't do this. I will never forgive him. And the rabbi told her, okay, you let the creator forgive him. Give it all up to the creator. And she did. And she moved on. Because the creator is the maker of each and every one of us. The great spirit. And the creator knows. And she was able to move on with her life. Because she gave it all up to the creator. And every day I do that. Every day I give up things to the creator. My late husband, Charles Koshaway, he and I prayed every single day. We got up in the morning, we gave gratitude for the sun, for the light, for the gifts of the day, whether they be good gifts or bad gifts, no matter what, that we make it through together. And there were many hard times. He just passed away a little over six months ago. But we were together for 32 beautiful years, side by side. We were so happy. He was Native American, just like me, and we saw life through the same lens. He was a beautiful man. He was Oto and Sack and Fox from Oklahoma. And he had that soft southern side to him. 
He was wonderful. We danced side by side at many Indian powwows. And uh, he had that uh, way about him. He was like E.F. Hutton. You know, when he said something, people listened. He was a wonderful, wonderful human being. I wish everybody knew him because he was just a great, great man. I called him Mr. Charles. And uh, COVID was wonderful because the two of us were together. And we spent so many beautiful moments together that way. But he had the same philosophy. He had examined himself so much before we both met in our 40s. And he was a prayerful man. And uh, we met at the right time in life. I wanted to know how much exposure you had to your father's native culture. Not much. I didn't have much exposure to his culture. I only knew the poverty, the abuse, the alcoholism, the genocidal umbrella of what Native American Indian people are born under and experience. I didn't really know the beauty of the culture, the songs, the dances, the tribal togetherness, and the, the wonderful things of being Native. It was so racist and ugly and, and, and poverty-written and so forth. I didn't really get to know the beautiful side of things until Alcatraz came along many years later when I got to rediscover who I am, who I really am. And I think that the mental institution had something to do with that before Alcatraz. I wrote something about that. It's called Identification. I mentioned to one big, white, sarcastic psych nurse at the hospital that I was American Indian. And she scoffed at me and made a sarcastic remark at me. It hurt me, but it also made me mad. I had always hated my Indian father for all the rotten, horrible, mean, and hurtful, abusive, hateful and belittling things that he had done to me. So it was already hard for me to identify with him as part of me. But it was a fact. I'm half Indian. I was raised white by my maternal grandparents. Due to economic, educational, survival, and practical circumstances. After one year at Agnew State Mental Institution and sufficient aftercare, I was ready to baby step and try out the real world. I felt fairly quiet about myself as I baby stepped. Alcatraz was a happening of all tribes coming together in San Francisco to reunite us as a group, to reinstate us as Indians in spite of all the isms. I wanted very much to find myself as an Indian person, to reclaim what was lost and to meet other Indians. I wanted to find a reason to live beyond suicide through cultural relevance and beauty, not the ugliness of all the isms that I knew all too well. I wanted to taste my culture, which had been denied me, and find a reason to live. 
This was a part of my own personal struggle for life itself. Being in touch with who I am, not to allow it to be taken away from me ever again, not to become embittered and damaged as my father had become in a white man's world, an opportunity to become beautiful, and thrive as a woman of beauty, strength, courage, and peace. Wow. So powerful. So many lessons in that. When did you first start to realize that you had interests in being artistic and creative? Well, my parents were artists. My mother was a pianist. And she, musically was beautiful. She took all of her feelings out on the piano. And my father was a terrific artist, as well as my mother, painting and drawing and so forth and so on. And the only thing that I could do and express myself is to write, as quiet as is kept. I really never shared my writings with anybody. I used to just keep secret little notebooks. I only shared my writings with you, Jacqueline, right now at age 75. I told you I write short writings. They're not long. They're only meant to be shared in just one setting, impactful less than 10 minutes. I often admired the writer Edgar Allan Poe, not because I'm into gore, like, you know, Lenore (laughs) in some of his writings, quote, the raven nevermore, but because he said that writings should be short and written so that people could Read it in one setting so they don't lose the impact of what is written. And I thought, gee, that's a novel idea because people go and they read and they read and they read and they're asleep and then they wake up and then they have to read later on and they forget and then it's two years later and they finally finish the book. Well, I love Shakespeare when I was in high school, it used to be my answer to insomnia. So when I really got tired and I went to go to sleep, I read Shakespeare. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. You're admitting that. (laughs) But I love Shakespeare. My favorite play was uh, Richard II. (laughs) That's great. That's great. In fact, I wrote a paper on Richard II and got an A on it. <laughs> My way of getting uh, getting even with white people was to be smarter than they were <laughs> and get a better grade. Because I wasn't a, I was a person of color and I was an Indian, they used to put me in the back of the class because they thought I was stupid. And when I got a better grade than everybody, they put me in the front of the class. <laughs> There you go. (laughs) I had to earn my way to the front seat. (laughs) Wow. Wow. None of the white kids had to do it. They just walked in the classroom. They were white. Okay, you could sit in the front. (laughs) What other hobbies did you have when you were young? I loved to swim. I was born in the water. I'm a Scorpio. November 14. I love, love, love to swim. I started swimming when I was, uh, what, about four or five? And I would never get out of the water. I remember one time I was in the deep end of the pool and I jumped in. I didn't care. It was water. It was deep. So what? And I almost drowned. And there was a man that when I was going under, he jumped in and pulled me out. And he did some, you know, pumping on me and I spit up some water. And I looked at him and I looked at everybody I said, gee, I'm okay. So I jumped right back in the water again. (laughs) It never stopped me. (laughs) 
If it was a mud puddle, I'd be in it and had water in it. Oh, my goodness. And when I was, you know, throughout school and the synchronized swimming team and so on and so forth, I just loved the water. I loved the ocean. I loved the lakes. I loved the swimming pools. When did you start getting involved in performing? Um, Performing. Well, you know, my father was deaf, so the only way I could communicate with him because I was too young and too distant from him to learn sign language. My parents spoke sign language to each other. And so I used to act out what I wanted to say to him. And it was very exaggerated. Uh, and I think that's when I really started acting out you know, using all of my body and expressions and everything to communicate with him out of necessity. It wasn't something that, you know, you you would do normally, but out of necessity, so he would get the message and understand. And um, there were some times where that was totally necessary. Um. I remember I was in a truck with him. We, he always had a truck. He drove a pickup truck. And um, he got stopped by the police uh, for doing something. I don't remember quite what it was. And I remember there was a police officer, and he started screaming and yelling at my father. And the final thing was, what are you, deaf? He yelled, and I leaned over, and I spoke on behalf of my father, and I said, yes, he is. He's totally deaf. He can't hear you. And the police officer said, what? What? And I said, yes, he is deaf. And I had to speak for him. And oftentimes as a child, I had to speak for it isn't something I wanted to do, but I had to do. So my mother was very shy, and I had to speak for her because she was very, very, very shy. So I was put in that role, and I'm the oldest one in the family. And my grandmother always pushed me out in front of the group to speak. And again, it wasn't a role that I wanted to do, but I had to do it. So there are many times that, you know, I became the spokesperson. And now it just comes naturally. I'm just unafraid to speak, you know. And I think I told you that... You know, I went through this horrible experience at the local Marin General Hospital. Yes. In which, you know, they did this liver biopsy procedure and this surgery, and they didn't use enough anesthetic on me, and they kept putting these sharp instruments into my liver without enough painkiller. And I spoke up for myself, and I told them, my God, please give me some more painkiller. And the medical doctor did not. And he put the second, second instrument in, and I yelled again, please give me some more anesthetic. And he did not. And he put the third instrument in me, and the same thing. And finally, I passed out. And the blood came shooting out everywhere. Well, I had to speak up for myself. There was no one in there to do it for me. And I became my own spokesperson. And I turned them into Medicare because that's who pays the bill at the hospital. Well, money talks and BS walks. So you have to be your own spokesperson. If you don't do it, who will? Mm. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's what happens in life. Even in the medical world. 
You know, it's, it's that way everywhere, Jacqueline. It's that way everywhere. If you don't do it, who will? Who will speak for you? you who just, will speak for you? You just mentioned you were the oldest. Yes. So how many siblings Two. do you have? Two younger ones. Uh-huh. And um, I think they were a lot shyer than I and afraid to speak up, perhaps. But they had their own set of difficulties. You know, I had to work through my own. But, um, and I did. I did a lot of work. I worked through a lot of therapy all during my lifetime. I put a lot of energy and effort into reevaluation, counseling, education, psychodrama, therapy in general and psychiatrists and so forth and so on, and was not afraid to delve into life's problems and answers and solutions and ways to help yourself to get through them. I think everybody needs to do that, sincerely, to help yourself and not to blame the other person. Oh, you're responsible for my problem. Therefore, that allows me to drink. That allows me to be a, an abuser. That allows me to, uh, you know, treat you in such a manner or blame you or this, that. No. Hey, take a mirror. <laughs> you know, y you have to become your own advocate and be responsible for your own behavior and take a look-see each and every day. How can I become the person that I want to be, and how can I like myself better today? And that is how you treat yourself and how do you treat others. And in, in reality, it's, a, it's a, not a me, myself, and I uh, society, but needs to be uh, a we, our, and us society where we operate together as a unit. And in the Native world, it is that way from the very beginning. We're the first environmentalists of this land. You know, we're the first ecologists of this land. When the white people came over here, the pilgrims, they didn't find a three-mile island. They didn't find all the timber cut up and dirty waters, you know. Uh, they didn't find all that. They found pristine land, clean waters, lots of timber. And uh, the environment was wonderful. And they came here by the gazillions. And they killed this off. People want to know about the first Thanksgiving. That meal was poisoned. And the Native people who attended that first Thanksgiving died. And the pilgrims were so thankful that the Indians were dead, they had this big meal by themselves because they killed off the Indians. Mm. That's a true story. That's not what we learn in school. No, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask you about movies. Movies. Do you remember the first movie that you saw or the first movie that had a major impression on you? I went with my grandfather, Barney. We called him Barney because his name was Gerald Barnett, so we called him Barney. It wasn't a dinosaur. It was just Barney. And I saw The Miracle of the Children of Fatima starring Gilbert Rowland. And the other was the film uh, called The Robe starring Richard Burton and uh, Gene Simmons, which was a movie about the, uh, the uh, Roman soldier and his girlfriend, I guess you'd call her his girlfriend, at the uh, crucifixion of Christ, which was amazing. And the most amazing part of it was when Christ was being crucified, and there was two robbers and murderers who were crucified with him. 
and it showed the mercy of Jesus Christ as he was dying on the cross. I remember this as a child. And one robber murderer looked over at Christ and said, if you're really the son of God, why don't you just let us off this cross, all of us, and take over and, um, you know, get back at everybody who's, who's doing us in. And the other guy, who was the robber murderer, said, he is really the son of God. He is who he is, who he said he is. So leave him alone. And then looked over at Jesus on the cross and said, remember me, Jesus, in your kingdom. And Jesus looked back at him and said, you will be with me this day. And Jesus put his head down and he died. And the robber murderer in Jesus' mercy was given total forgiveness and died and went to heaven. And Richard Burton and his girlfriend believed in Jesus as the Son of God. This is all in the film. And they were executed in the film for believing in him. And they both went to heaven. And I remember that as a small girl. And it was a beautiful, impactful film. And then when Jennifer Jones played the song of Bernadette, which she won an Academy Award for, the most beautiful part of that film was nobody believed her when she saw the Virgin Mary um, in France and Our, Our Lady of Lords. And finally, at the end of her life, she was only 24 years old, she had this incredible, painful um, tuberculosis of the bone. And there was this very hateful nun who did everything she could to discredit Bernadette Subaru, who became the nun. And she, Jennifer Jones playing the nun, uh, was doing an exercise in the yard and she fell. She couldn't exercise anymore. And they called the doctor for her and she was taken to her cell also a room where she lived. And the doctor examined her. And the doctor said to the nun who hated her and the mother superior, has she ever complained of pain? And they said, no, not to our knowledge. And the doctor told them, she has such a horrible case of tuberculosis of the, ba of the bone that she must be in excruciating pain. I don't know how she could ever stand up or walk, ever. And the nun who hated her said, Oh my God, I persecuted her for so long. And she really is who she says she is. Please forgive me. And Bernadette had this nun by her side for the rest of her life until she died. And Bernadette did die and see Our Lady come to her on her deathbed. And Bernadette died and her body never decayed. And Bernadette lays in state to this day in perfect undecayed beauty in France where she lay as a miracle of God. And that movie had a very big impact on me when I was small. So I remember those three films, and I saw them with my grandfather. That's incredible. Do you remember where you saw these movies? Um, I think there was a Fox Theater that we used to go to. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the prices were a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because it was so long ago. But... Um, my grandfather and I used to pray together every single day. He was a great fan of the rosary. 
and my grandfather and I used to pray the rosary every day. And my grandfather and I used to go to Mass and Communion every day, every morning before he went to work. And uh, we did that for years and years and years. My grandfather was a big working man. He was a printer for the Monterey Peninsula Herald newspaper in Monterey, California. And uh, he had these big working man hands, and he would say the rosary. And I had these little girl hands, and I would say the rosary right next to his side. And we would pray together every day. And uh, I always remember my grandfather, Barney. He was such a wonderful man. He was uh, a big giant. He was over six feet tall. And he was always very good to me. He was very loving. He was very kind. But if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah, he. I. it must have been very hard for him because he was very old when I was young. And my grandmother Marie, too, the same thing. But they taught me many lessons. I think I wrote something about that. I wrote, The Mother Mary appeared to Bernadette as silently as a thought. Bernadette was amazed as she knelt quietly in prayer, saying her daily rosary. Therefore, before her eyes appeared this apparition of the Virgin Mary, Mother of Jesus. Who was she? Bernadette Subaru, a poor child from a poor family in France. Upon where Our Lady appeared, Bernadette was asked to dig in the earth for water, and thereupon appeared a spring, just as the Lady had said, a spring of miraculous healing water for everyone except for Bernadette, for she was to dedicate her life to God for the love of Jesus. She was to identify with his sufferings upon a cross, develop a serious and excruciating, painful case of tuberculosis of the bone, and never whimper a word of pain or complain until she mentioned it one day to a Catholic nun who was a superior, where she, Bernadette, had been consecrated to a life of prayer as a nun herself. She died testifying to the fact that the Virgin Mary had appeared to her at Lourdes, France as a young girl and brought the message of love, hope, peace, and prayer through the Most Holy Rosary to the world. Many were healed from their maladies as they went to Lourdes, France to drink the sacred waters as promised by Our Lady Mary to Bernadette Subaru so many years ago. She has since become Saint Bernadette of France, and the place is world famous, known simply as Our Lady of Lourdes. Saint Bernadette's physical body lies in state under glass, undecayed to this day, as a testament to her undying love to both Our Lady Mary and her son Jesus. Holy water is held sacred by many who have experienced this miraculous healing and shared the story and the faith of St. Bernadette, who died so young at age 24, when once the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, appeared silently as a thought to her. I, as a Catholic, believe this to be true. Mm, wow. Thank you. Thank you. What a reflection. Wow. And I have water from Our Lady of Lords in my drawer in there. And I've drank some of it. Oh, my goodness. During my cancer years. Mm -hmm. And I'm still alive to this day. <laughs> and my oncologist has called me her rock superstar <laughs> as a patient because I've outlived everyone else. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. It is incredible. Mm hmm because mm -hmm. I've had stage four for a while and I've been terminal but I'm still here but you're still here well yeah. you mentioned she was 24 because I want to I want to start talking about your young adulthood and what brought you here like what brought you to the Bay Area 
Oh, um, I've always lived in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. I've never lived in L.A. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, I've never lived in L.A. I've always been here. Um, I've just uh, just never had a hankering to go to Los Angeles except to visit friends and be there for a little while. Um, that's just the way it's been. Uh huh. When and where did you start college? Oh, I started at a junior college down in Salinas, and I was there for a couple of years until I graduated. And then um, I came up here to the Bay Area and then uh, went to school on scholarships and grants. What were you studying? I studied for the first two years just to get the requirements out of the way. You know, I figured that was the best way. And then I started in education because I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Um, And then I finally went back to school and graduated in holistic health and education with a minor in traditional Indian medicine, the study of plants and herbs, because that was my real love. That's after Brando and after I got boycotted uh, because I had a bout with my health that my lungs collapsed like two flat tires on a freeway. And I had to um, have them both uh, operated on in order to continue living because uh, I was not not doing well. Um, And I had to go on a purging, cleansing uh, diet, which I did. And I had a good friend by the name of Dr. Linus Pauling, who is the father of vitamin C. And he had a friend here in the Bay Area who happened to be... uh, just in my neighborhood by the name of Dr. Michael Gerber, who was a medical doctor. And he and his wife ran a a clinic, a holistic health clinic. And I became their prized patient for about three or four years. I became a total vegetarian, uh, shut out the rest of the world, and just concentrated on cleansing and lifestyle changes, et cetera, et cetera, till I could get my lungs breathing again properly. And I purged out all of my body, totally. And it worked. Wow. So I went back to school and picked up the rest of my units, et cetera, and majored uh, in uh, holistic health and nutrition with a minor in Native American medicine. And I had gone through acupuncture. I had gone through um, physical therapy, Qigong, Siasu massage, uh, herbology, uh, food is medicine, all sorts of things that I have already experienced. I had firsthand knowledge of it because it saved my life. So I began to teach uh, workshops in it because I was very proficient in all of this. And I went out to Indian country and I worked for the University of Oklahoma uh, in their workshops uh, throughout the United States. I worked through Indian Health Service and developed my own workshops with them. And I went uh, and developed a traditional Indian medicine program with another group of Native Americans in Tucson, Arizona at St. Mary's Hospital. It was one of the first traditional Indian medicine programs in the United States of America. And the reason is because 75% of that hospital is Native American Indian people. And when medicine people came to help the patients, the Indian patients in that hospital, they were laughed at. They were treated disrespectfully, 
and so on and so forth by the staff, the doctors, the this, that, and the other thing. So we came there to educate everybody from the CEO of the hospital to the director, to the medical staff, to the nurses, to the janitors, to everybody about what Indian medicine was all about. From A to Z. Right. And I taught the classes on traditional Indian medicine and nutrition, food as medicine. And then I went to work for the Kiowa tribe in Oklahoma, and uh, I taught uh, traditional Indian uh, nutrition and holistic health and herbs there. And uh, that was back in 1982. And that was great. But I missed the Bay Area and the ocean. So my girlfriend, Nancy Ingram, who was Ojibwe, she sent me a big picture of the ocean. And I put that on my wall. <laughs> you'd think you'd miss something, but I missed the ocean. And I had a big picture that I got up to every day. And uh, I remember this Kiowa family that I was really close to there. They had a good sense of humor. And I got used to Oklahoma, Kiowa humor, you know. And uh, I was going through this buffalo range to get to work every morning in uh, Carnegie, Oklahoma. I lived in Anadarko back then. And uh, uh, when I went through this buffalo range, I used to have this little uh, little tiny foreign car. And I had to stop because there were so many buffalo that were crossing the road. And uh, they're big, you know, and you're small compared to a big buffalo. And they'd come over and they'd breathe on my car. And they'd just look in with their big faces. And they had buffalo breath, for real. And I'd just look, and I'd hope that, you know, they wouldn't react to my engine or anything, because I just turned the car all the way off. And when they'd finished crossing by, and they'd gone away, I'd start up the car again, and away I'd go. So I was telling the story to this Kiowa family at dinner that night. So they were listening and everything, and then this uh, old man who was the elder of the family, he listened and everything, and he got up and he said, Well, Sasheen. I only have one question to ask you. And I said, well, what's that? He said, did any of them recognize you? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody just laughed. <laughs> and the first word that I heard in Kiowa that I learned there with the Kiowa tribe was Hangada. And I was busy visiting with uh, some Kiowas at lunchtime. And uh, they had a big spread all put out and everything at the Kiowa Senior Center because I worked with uh, Gus Palmer Jr. there for the Kiowa Senior Center. And everybody rushed to that lunch table and just was getting all their plates filled just as fast as they could. And I turned around and everything, and I grabbed my plate. There wasn't much left. And I looked at one of the seniors, and he looked at me and said, hang a da. I said, what's that mean? He said, it's all gone. <laughs> wow. Wow. Let's talk about how you discovered acting oh. and how modeling and acting kind of came together for you alongside the activism that you were involved with at a young age. Well, acting... Uh, I got involved not only by the fact that my father was deaf and I had to act out messages to him when I was small, but when I was uh, in grammar school, I had a teacher who liked to work with uh, film and cameras. And so we were doing a play called Snow White. And uh, she wanted to put all of us in different characters in the play. You know, Snow White definitely wanted, didn't want to play her because she was too boring. And besides, I didn't fit the image anyway. 
And then there were the dwarves, and I was too tall for that. And uh, then there was Prince Charming, and of course I didn't want to play that, but they had the Wicked Queen. Now that appealed to me, because she had some depth. So I thought, yeah, I want to play her, you know. So I ended up playing her, and she filmed it. And that was just great. So I ended up being in a couple of her plays. And I thought, gee, this feels good. This feels really good. I wish I would have had some of that film now to play it back. I was only nine years old back then. And um, I participated in some of these plays when I was small. You know, and it was sort of exciting and so forth. Then when I got older, I found I was a little too shy because there were mainly white people roles and a little too boring and all of that sort of thing, and I was kind of shy. But when I got older, there was this really Ichabod Crane type of guy who had a camera, and we were just buddies and friends, and he wanted to go out and take some photographs. And I said, okay. So I went out and bought a makeup kit and put some makeup on and so forth. And uh, I had contact lenses in those days, so that was pretty good. And we went out. The pictures turned out nice. I was really shocked. And so we took a lot of photographs. And wow, what a difference. So I smiled and everything like that. And I said, oh, these are pretty good. So we went out and showed them to a couple of people. And they said, hey, you could do some modeling. So I said, oh, this sounds fine. So I went out and did some modeling and turned out good. So I modeled for some of the, the department stores over in Monterey, California, and took some more pictures and ended up in a couple of ads and everything. But there was only one problem. I got tagged with the word exotic. And the word exotic kept me out of a lot of work. It wasn't that you're a person of color. It was that you're too exotic. That was a tag word that you don't belong. Wow. Wow. Yep. Wow. And way back in the old days, we're going back into the 60s, uh, there weren't many people like me that were out there. And I can remember that even in broadcasting, when I broke into radio at KFRC, the big 610 in San Francisco, which was a major rock and roll station, uh, and there were very, if any, people of color, women of color, because it was so misogynistic and so racist that there were only men in broadcasting and no women. And the only women who were on TV was Barbara Walters. And she was a Jewish journalist, a woman who had made it big time into television with Hugh Downs. And you could watch her on national television. And the only woman of color who was on national television was on CV, CBS News was Connie Chung. And she was Chinese. And she was so unusual that she made it onto the cover of Time magazine. That's how unusual she was. So those are the only two women that I really remember. Now, today, people would laugh about that. But believe me, I am so relieved at um, the Black uh, you know, Lives Matter movement because now you have people of color in advertisement using soap, eating food, buying homes, driving automobiles, getting coffee at Starbucks or whatever. I mean, wearing shoes, uh, making purchases everywhere. Before that, it was a Clorox factory. You know, when I was at the Academy Awards, it was looking out into a sea of Clorox. 
I mean, it was so unrealistic to a realistic person like myself. Mm-hmm. It was just amazing. What led you to write to Marlon Brando? And when you wrote a letter to him, what did your letter say? Well, initially with Marlon, there was a lot of people that were going out to Alcatraz Island. There was uh, people like um, uh, Anthony Quinn, for example. He was going to be in a movie called Flap. And he was going to play an Indian person. So he went out to do some research, Alcatraz Island. Then there was Jane Fonda, the activist. So she went to Alcatraz Island. Then there were other people who were going to play Indians, like Charles Bronson, for example. And, uh, you know, before that, you'd had Burt Lancaster and other white people playing Indians, et cetera, et cetera. And so I wondered, was Marlon Brando, the actor, going to play an Indian? Is that why he was interested in us? Was he doing research for a film? Or was he really interested in Native American Indian people for real? So I wanted to, as an activist, know if he was interested in us as a group of people. So I wrote him a very sincere letter asking him if his interest in us was real. I had heard that he was up visiting Hank Adams, who was an activist up in the state of Washington. And he had been over to Alcatraz Island and if his interest in Indian people was genuine. And I didn't know how to get the letter to him because he was a very private person. So I used to walk the hills of San Francisco because I lived there and One of my neighbors was Francis Ford Coppola, who directed him in The Godfather. And on one of my walks up and down the hills of San Francisco, which is very good exercise, incidentally, um, I ran into Francis Ford Coppola sitting on the porch of his house. So I got to, to chat it up with him. And in one of my walks, I said, oh, by the way, I have this letter from Marlon Brando, and you directed him in The Godfather, didn't you? And he said, yeah. I said, well, do you think it would be okay if you, if you, uh, you can read this letter, you know, and I want to get it to him. And if you think it's okay, would you see that he gets it? And he said, okay, I read the letter. Seems pretty legit to me, pretty straightforward. I said, gee, thanks. I really appreciate it. You know, I'm not trying to pull anything. I just want to see if he's legitimately interested. Well, Francis Ford was pretty good. He is pretty straightforward type of person. And so we can, I continued to walk the hills and he continued to be on his porch and we continued to qua, qua, qua every once in a while. Well, I never heard anything from Marlon Brando. And I was still working at KFRC Radio as the public service director of that station. And so as a result, a whole year had passed by. I didn't hear anything. Well, I wasn't expecting anything. One day I was at the station and this mysterious call came through for me. But the person on the other end of the line would not give his name. So they said, do you want to speak to this person? I said, sure, why not? So they put the call through. And uh, it was sort of kind of the end of the day at work. And so I picked up the phone and the voice said, I bet you don't know who this is, do you? And I said, yes, I know exactly who this is. And he said, well, who is it? I said, this is Marlon Brando. And I said, it sure took you long enough. I said, you beat Indian time all to hell. And we both started laughing, just like we known each other our whole life. And then we just took off on a conversation 
and like we were best friends for a long time. And I mean, I didn't care what his name was. He, we had a lot in common and so on and so forth. And uh, we just took off from that point forward to a lot of conversations. Then finally I had to tell him, hey, you really can't call me at work anymore because this is work. And I have to work here. I can't have long conversations with people. If you want to talk to me some more, you have to call me at home. So I gave him my home number. And this is when I'm available at home. Mm -hmm. So he knocked off calling me at work and he called me at home. So that was good. Then finally, after a while, he gave me his home phone number, his private number, that I could call him back. So we had a two-way conversation going on. And that continued for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he said he had received my letter, and that was good. And I wrote him more letters. And uh, I did find out uh, during the last couple of years that he had kept all my letters. And they, that they are in his archives. Wow. In his private vault mm. after he died. Wow. Wow. Did you talk about acting with him? No. I never talked about acting with him. You mean me being yeah, an actress? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. No, our relationship. the craft of acting? Or no, like no, no. Mm -hmm. Our relationship was not built on the craft of acting or being in films or anything. It was just two people who had a lot in common, who spoke about Indians, politics, activism, uh, culture of Indians, wounded knee, uh, movies, films, uh, sports mascots, uh, everything dealing in, on that level, mm -hmm. you know, and so forth. And I was very busy um, with the Affirmative Action Committee for Screen Actors Guild and working with other minorities, people of color, mm -hmm. in, in that vein. And also... I worked with the Rainbow Coalition in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, principally, I worked very closely with Frank Chin, who was a Chinese playwright. And a group of us would make frequent trips to the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, and make reports to the FCC about what programs with people of color were playing or not and what the stereotype was of people of color uh, that was occurring on television on a regular basis. And the Chinese had Charlie Chan and so forth. The Hispanic people had the Frito Bandito. The black people had Little Black Sambo. And we had you know, the Agamuk Indian. So we all had these different stereotypes that we were working on to get rid of, you know, including the sports mascot. And I had worked on getting rid of the Stanford Indian at Stanford University. It used to be the Stanford Indian mascot. Yes. And we got rid of that. And I worked with the Committee of Indians way before the Oscar to get rid of that. And after the Academy Award, uh, I worked with the local high school here, Mount Tam High School Indians. I worked with a friend of mine who was a full-blood Delaware Indian, Titus Frenchman, who now lives in Oklahoma. And he's, whole, he's head of the uh, Delaware Elder Society back home. Um, he and I worked together to educate the Tam High Indian students there about why you shouldn't name a sports mascot after a race of people. Like, you don't have the Tam High Spicks, you don't have the Tam High Jews, you don't have the Tam High Negroes, 
and you don't have the Tamhai Indians. Uh, so therefore, you need to, uh, to name your, your high school uh, mascot after an animal totem, like the Tamhai Eagles, the Tamhai Hawks, uh, the, the, the Tamhai Lions, or some other animal totem. And so we uh, help them with a play uh, that was Indian-based that had been written by one of their professors there. And in that play, they educated the rest of the student body on why it's inappropriate to have a sports mascot after an Indian uh, race of people. And by the end of the year, they had educated the rest of the student body by presenting this play to the rest of the students about why it was inappropriate. So they took an independent democratic vote and voted that mascot out. And ever since we did that, they voted in to call themselves the Tam High Hawks. And that was, gee, more than 30 years ago. Wow. More than 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I also was a founder, one of the founding board directors of the American Indian AIDS Foundation in San Francisco. And I've always worked in hospice work ever since I was young. I didn't mention it to you, but I was born after World War II, and a lot of my friends' fathers uh, who served in World War II came back as uh, having their legs blown off in World War II, so they were handicapped, or losing an eye and, and being blind, and so forth. So I grew up with a lot of people who are handicapped. And uh, that gave me a great sense of compassion and empathy toward people who were different, not necessarily because of color, but because of injury and so forth. And uh, as I grew older, I nurtured that sense within me. And I helped a lot of people who were sick. And uh, I helped my own father, who I had this tumultuous relationship with. He died of cancer in his early 40s. And he got cancer initially when he was 34. He died of cancer of the lung. And I took care of him before he died, which was truly amazing given the relationship that I had with him. And to just give you an idea of the narcissistic personality that he had, uh, when I announced to him after I'd been accepted by three different universities when I was 17, I was so happy about this because I worked so hard for this when I was young. And I went up to him and I said, oh, I said, I've been accepted by these three universities, you know, to go to school. And he looked at me and he said, oh, trying to be better than me, huh? And walked away. And my heart just sank, and I started to cry. And I went to my grandmother. I was so hurt. Because it had nothing to do with that. It had nothing to do with that at all. And yet, the, the horrible relationship that I'd had with this person, who never apologized to me at all for everything that he had done, and yet, I poured love into him by taking care of him at the very last of his life. And at the very last of his life, as he was dying, uh, my father converted to Catholicism. And I was there to see it happen. And I was there, I had this very cheap ring 
And uh, I was there to witness my parents' marriage in the Catholic Church. And I was so very young back then. Wow. And then my father died after that. So my hospice work started early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I went to work in hospice work. And I hadn't had any formal training, but I'd already begun my journey with that. And I got trained by the best of the best with Mother Teresa of Calcutta. She formed a hospice center in San Francisco on Fell Street. And I had another friend who was getting trained by her. I just went, and there she was. And so I started to work with AIDS patients. And I'd already uh, had started with some other friends of mine being on the board of directors and uh, starting this organization for Indians with AIDS. We didn't have any money. We didn't have gas money to put into a car, but we went up to Sacramento with a barred automobile and uh, we handed in our paperwork and uh, did all of that with nothing in the very beginning. We needed the training. Everybody opened the doors for us because Indian people were killing themselves because they had AIDS and they didn't know where to go. So we had to help our own people with AIDS. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It was just paramount. So that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I worked with Mother Teresa, she was amazing. She had the best sense of humor of anybody I've ever known. She was so down to earth. And uh, she was just so funny and so much herself. Uh, she didn't care if you were Hindu, Muslim, Catholic, Protestant. She didn't care who you were. You were a human being. And she loved you no matter what. You could feel her joy and love in the room where you were. Wow. Amazing human being. Wow. I had, in a way, all of these saints that I was working with. Mother Teresa. I had... Kateri Tiketawitha, who was our first American Indian saint to be, uh, that was born in 1624. She was a Mohawk. I met Pope Jean Paul the 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 second, and um, all these amazing people that came into my life. Oh. I met Jean Paul II at a Kateri Tiketawitha conference in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, he asked for the forgiveness of Native Americans and what the Catholic Church had done to them with missionaries and all of that. This goes way, way back. Uh, I think it was in the 80s. Uh, and when the Pueblo people uh, Indian people presented Jean Paul with an eagle feather, which is the highest thing that you can do to, to someone, give them an eagle feather. Um, Jean Paul wept, and I saw the tears come down his face. And I was sitting right there in front. And uh, he gave us a special blessing. And it was a beautiful thing to behold. And it seems like I had all these special people that were knocking at my door of life. And why me? I have no idea. But it happened. And then I became very special friends with Father Ken Tejan, who was a monastic priest in uh, Piasta, Iowa, at a Trappist monastery. And I went back there on a vacation for 12 years in a row for a week uh, as a prayer retreat and put together a Katiri prayer retreat for Native Americans from around the United States. 
and uh, we uh, we we prayed there together as a group, ate vegetarian food grown by the monks and the priest, and it was a beautiful experience. We even put together a Kateri powwow hmm. there and shared uh, all these things with our good friend Father Ken. And they don't refer to him in the monastery, the rest of the priests and monks, as Father Ken. They refer to him as a saint. He's 94 right now, and he's my best friend. And as a gift from the Cancer Center, I was given the gift of going to see him for the last time. And I got to spend a week with him mm. there at the monastery as our last time mm. together. He's dying right now. So it was a beautiful thing to know that he's a saint. And he is. He's even told me and whether you believe it or not, I believe it. He told me that Jesus and Mary appeared to him. And that's something that you don't take lightly. And he told me that there are three things that you need to get to heaven. And that's what Jesus told him. Now, if Jesus had appeared to me and told me, and I said, what are they, Father Ken? And he said, Jesus told him, you need love, forgiveness, and gratitude. And you need to show love to your fellow human being and to yourself. And those are the three things that you need in order to get to heaven. Now that is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. And I believe Father Ken. He's a very holy man. And he's always spoken the truth to me. And when I'm with Father Ken, I've always felt like I'm about three feet off the ground and very, very happy and very, very joyful. And everybody else who's ever been with him has felt exactly the same way. And the other times that I've felt that way are when I'm in medicine ceremonies, Native American church ceremonies, at mass sometimes when I'm there, receiving the Eucharist, when Mr. Charles was baptized a Catholic on his deathbed, when I was with Pope Jean Paul, when Kateri Tukethawitha in Rome was canonized a saint and I was there to witness it in person, all of these beautiful moments that I've had in life. I've had some really beautiful moments, some really fantastic moments. I tell you, it's been an amazing life, and I have never been bored. <laughs> never. Wow. You know, there are four parts of a human being, the mental, the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual, all working in the great circle of life together. And each one has to be nourished in order to be a person. Mm. And most people only live from here up, you know, thinking in their head, talking heads. But from here down is where it really takes place. This is where the knowledge and the wisdom comes from up here, this way, so that we really know in our hearts this is where the truth comes from. Take us back through the phone call that you received on March 26, 1973, the day before the Oscars, when Marlon floated the idea that you would speak for him. What happened that day? 
that was, uh, I got the call from Marlon Brando on Saturday, which was, as I recall, the day before the Academy Awards. And I was surprised as anybody because I was planning on watching the Academy Awards on television, just like everybody else. And in no way was I planning on attending the Academy Awards. So it came as a surprise to me. Like, surprise, surprise, you know, like Gomer Pyle would say. I mean, I was just floored. What? And I said, are you kidding? I don't have anything to wear. Well, what would you usually wear? What do you wear out? Well, just a t-shirt and a pair of jeans. Well, you can't wear that. I said, well, I don't have any evening wear. Well, what can you wear? I said, well, when I dance at powwows in the Bay Area, I have my buckskin dress, my moccasins, and hair ties. Well, then wear that. And I said, oh, well, and he said, Marlon said to me, well, that sounds okay. So I guess you could say he chose, Marlon chose my wardrobe for me. And uh, that's what I wore. Packed my suitcase and left for Los Angeles for his house, where I, I had visited him before and had been his house guest. But I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea what to expect. I'd never been to the Academy Awards in my life. Uh, I never fraternized with movie stars like that in my life. And I'd never been to a big ceremony like that in my life. Mm. It was so, all new to me. When you got to his house, what was the scene like there? What was explained to you? Or what was happening in terms of writing the speech? Uh, when I got to Marlon Brando's house, there was not much that was explained to me. I got there, it was fairly casual. Uh, his children were playing basketball, swimming in the pool, and his nephew was practicing guitar with a friend of his. It was fairly casual, mm -hmm. fairly, you know, low, low, um, oh, how would you oh, say yeah. it? Low key. Low key. It was low key. Well, hi, Sashin. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Want to get your swimsuit? Go swimming? Well, no, I don't think so. How about practicing guitar? Well, I don't exactly play guitar. Uh, I think I'll just sit a while. And then I went and I asked his secretary, Alice, uh, had she heard anything from Roland? No, he's in his room. He's working. Oh, okay. And I waited and I waited and I waited. And pretty soon Marlon came out and he had an intercom system in his house. So he didn't want to be disturbed. He would uh, be notified on the intercom when he wanted to be disturbed or not. So he just waited. So I think I had a snack or something like that that his cook fixed for me. And I thought, well, I wonder what this is all about. So when did you find out what it was about? How did the plan get explained to you? Pretty much last minute. It was pretty spontaneous. There wasn't really a great deal that was explained to me, other than the fact that if he won, I was to go up and refuse it for him. And that's all that really was explained to me. Hmm. And I didn't even know who his competitors were as far as the competition was concerned. 
So it was very vague in my mind. And I didn't even know where the Dorothy Chandler Purveyon was. I didn't know how we were going to get there. I didn't know who was driving. Um, I didn't know how long it took to get there from his house. I had no idea. And as it were, um, he was in his room and he didn't get through with the initial speech. It must have been Sunday evening, somewhere about maybe five or six o'clock in the evening. And Alice had to type it up. And I got dressed in my buckskin, etc. And we really didn't leave for the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion until after seven. And the program was due to end at nine. And we really didn't reach there until about 8.30 in the evening. And I think they'd rolled up the red carpet. And uh, everything looked pretty empty from the outside. So at that point, I didn't know how we were going to get in there. There were guards all over the place. And when we got to the front door, his secretary and I, somebody let us in, and we had this official invite for Marlon Brando, and we were two strangers, literally, who were out the front door with the Marlon Brando invite. So they called Howard Koch, who was the producer of the whole Academy Awards, and literally, there was only 15 minutes left of the official program. So talk about being fashionably late. We were that, exactly. So he read the invite, and I said, yes, I'm a Marlon Brando's official representative here this evening. And here I am, an Indian, dressed in an official buckskin dress with moccasins on my feet and and my hair and hair ties. And then there was his secretary, and she recognized, he recognized her. And so he said, well, okay. But then he saw this speech that I had in my hand, and then he said, well, you can't read that. We only have so much time left. And if you read that, I will have you arrested. You will get 60 seconds or less. And you see those police? I will have them officially arrest you. I will have you put in jail. I will have you put in handcuffs. You will be embarrassed. Marlon will be embarrassed. So you have 60 seconds or less if he should win. And I had to make him that promise, and I did. I also had made Marlon Brando a promise that I would not touch that Academy Award statue if he should win. So I had two big promises to keep that night. Hmm. And did all of that happen before you took a seat in the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then you got seated. and I got seated with his secretary in between a commercial break. Mm. And we sat in the first two rows where the candidates for the Academy Award were seated. And uh, it was very hurried. Everything was very hurried. And when the commercial was over, the candidates for the Best Actor for the Academy Awards came on the screen. So I had very little time to think about, should he win, what will I say? Right, right. And I saw his face uh, and clips from The Godfather come on the screen. And I thought, I have less than 60 seconds, should he win? And, of course, my heart was rushing.
and then they called out his name. So I took a couple of deep breaths and I said a prayer. And I walked up those that stairway and tried not to fall over my buckskin fringes and be as graceful as I possibly could. And I prayed that my ancestors would be with me. I walked as gracefully as I possibly could, and they announced that I was indeed represented him, representing Marlon that evening. And I took a deep breath, and then I said that I'm Sasheen Littlefeather. I'm Marlon Brando's official representative here this evening. And that, unfortunately, he cannot receive this Academy Award because of the image of Native American Indian people in film and television today. That's when people started booing and the other half started cheering. And that's when all the people started getting into commotion in the audience. And I focused in on the mouths and the jaws that were dro dropping open in the audience. And there were quite a few. But it was like looking into a sea of Clorox. You know, there were very few people of color in the audience. And uh, I just took a deep breath, put my head down for a second. And then when they quieted down, I continued. And also because of the recent happenings in Wounded Knee, South Dakota, um, I had hoped that Marlon's decision would meet with your graciousness and understanding. And I hope that we can, you know, agree to, you know, move forward, basically. And uh, I said, thank you on behalf of Marlon Brando. And I didn't touch the statue. I held up my hand to both Roger Moore and Lee Volman. And Lee Volman happened to be my favorite actress because she had started all Ing Ingmar Bergman's films, who was her husband, actually. And Ingmar Bill Bergman was my favorite director. And uh, I thought, oh boy, it would have to be Lee Volman. <laughs> Roger Moore, nah, I didn't care that much for it. But Lee Volman, that was a different story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I left the stage. And um, it was interesting because some, some people were giving me the tomahawk chop. Backstage? Yes. And others were going, you know, and I thought, this is very racist, very racist indeed. And I just gracefully walked and ignored them. Were you walking by yourself? Yes. Oh, and then they put two armed guards around me. And then they said they were going to take me to these different press rooms. One was for television press, radio press, and international press. And I would have about 10 minutes in each press room. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And then was escorted out the door. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know who would be there because his secretary had gotten lost. And so I was walking out the door all by myself. And fortunately, his nephew, who had been playing and practicing guitar that afternoon, showed up at the back door with his guitar practicing buddy, driving his secretary's Cadillac. So they whisked me in the back seat of, of the Cadillac, and we took off with this crowd following behind us of paparazzi. What happened to his secretary, I do not know. 
When you got off stage, did you feel that you were in danger given all of the animosity that you were? Somewhat, yes. Yeah. But I was also very naive because I'd never been in that situation before. And besides that, I was, uh, I was pledged into silence. I didn't uh, tell anybody not even my own family. I didn't let anybody know. So nobody knew. So you can imagine everyone was in the state of shock. In the press rooms, did you share the entire speech? Because one thing you say when you're on stage is that you can make the speech available to people since you couldn't read the whole thing. I don't think I did, and that there was too many flash bulbs going off and too many questions about what's this all about and too many questions flashing and coming at me. And it would have taken too much time to read that speech. And people were more interested in the sensationalism yep. of the whole thing, wanting to make it a, a gimmicky thing instead of a sincerity thing wanting to make it a commercial venture instead of something that was sincere from the heart. And um, a lot of cheap thoughts, uh, shots were thrown at me. And there was a lot of rumors, you know, gossip columnists about that were trying to make it something that it was not. And uh, I was boycotted uh, from every talk show while people talked about me I could not and was not allowed to speak for myself it was though I was silenced and uh, the FBI and I'm not talking full-blooded Indians here I'm talking about the the FBI went around and planted lies about me to the studios, et cetera, et cetera, saying I wasn't really an Indian. I rented a buckskin dress, uh, that I was did this for my career. I mean, all sorts of things that were untrue. They said to the studios, if you hire her, we'll put you out of business, et cetera, et cetera. And I had some friends in the industry who called me up and told me that this was going on, that I, didn't, that I had no knowledge of, that if they hired me, they would shut their production down. And all these talk show hosts like Dick Cavett at the time, uh, the Johnny Carson show, um, Merv Griffin, uh, Dick Cavett, blah, blah, blah. If any of these people let me on their show, that they would shut them down. They could talk all about me, but I had no voice to talk uh, for myself. So I became a gossip item. What was the reaction of the people you were close to? Well, um, people like Coretta King, who was the widow of Martin Luther King, uh, she spoke up for me. And she got word to me that she was very supportive. And she knew that I was sincere and genuine. And she was the real deal. And I knew that when she was behind me, that I had done the right thing. Other Indian leaders, like Orrin Lyons, who was chief of the Onondaga, Russell Means, who was one of the American Indian movement leaders, Dennis Banks, who was one of the American Indian leaders, movement leaders, uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, who was a leader in the uh, Chicano movement, People like this who were supporting me 
I knew I had done the right thing. And then everybody else didn't matter because these were real people. And it didn't matter what others had said at that point. I knew that I paid the price of admission so that others could follow, that I had done something, that I was the first to make a statement, a political statement, the first Native American Indian woman, the first woman of color to ever make a statement at the Academy Awards telling the truth about the way that it really is. Not the second, not the third, not the fourth, but the first one. And that will always historically be true. And that others would follow in my, my footsteps because of what I had done. And at t in time, it would be recognized. In time, the doors would be open. And in time, the things that I wanted back then would become a reality. That people would, Native American Indian people, would be employed. All we were asking and I was asking was, let us be employed. Let us be ourselves. Let us play ourselves in films. Let us be a part of your industry, producing, directing, writing. Don't write our stories for us. Let, our, let us write our own stories. Let us be who we are. This is all I was saying. And yet it was met with such hostility and anger. And I nearly paid the price with my life as a result. There were people who were out to get me after the fact. After that, when I went back to Marlon's house, there was an incident with people shooting at me. And uh, there were two bullet holes that came through the doorway of where I was standing. And I was on the other side of it. And you say, therefore, by the grace of God, go I. And uh, I said to myself, well, people really get worked up. And they do. And they become hostile and violent, which is true. And, you know, it's, it's situations like this that make you really think, you know, what if, what if, what if. And yet I was never allowed to tell my story, never. Never. And now 50 years or so later, and here we are. For the first time, the first time. I also wanna mention that at the Academy Awards that night, when I was up on that stage, there was a mo major commotion backstage that was caused by John Wayne, the actor. He did not like what I was saying up at the podium. So he came forth in a rage to physically assault and take me off the stage. And he had to be restrained by six security men in order for that not to happen. And that perhaps was going to be the most violent act that had ever occurred at the Academy Awards itself. So therefore, by the grace of God, go I. 
the angels and my ancestors were really looking after me. And he was pulled back from going after me and he was he did not assault me because of those six security men. Were you aware that was happening while you were on stage? I heard a commotion backstage, yes. But I handled it very calmly. Yes, you did. Yes. Incredibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But people don't realize what my experience was. They had absolutely no idea, none, of what my experience was what I went through as a result of naivete, total ignorance. And now I'm here to tell my story the way that it was from my point of view, from my experience. What did Marlon Brando say to you when you got back? Roland said, congratulations. He said, you did well. And he was proud of me and proud of my efforts. And we watched on television all the major news channels throughout the world. This is the first time in television history that the Academy Awards was televised outside of the United States of America via satellite throughout the world. So all of the world's media was watching. And as a result, the people who were in the newspaper business and the television business outside of the United States descended upon Wounded Knee in South Dakota. I learned from Orrin Lyons, who's chief of the Onondaga Nation in New York, who was a friend of mine, that the United States Army was intending on building a uh, missile base at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. And there were the world's media, because the Academy Awards had been viewed via satellite to millions of people throughout the world, and the world's media descended upon Wounded Knee in South Dakota, South Dakota to cover the happenings at Wounded Knee and foiled the plans of the FBI to send Dennis Banks, Russell Means, and all the occupants away to a place like Guant Guant oh, yeah, Guantanamo. Guantanamo Bay, thank you, mm -hmm. where they would never be heard from again. And because of my speech at Wounded Knee, it foiled their plans. So that did not happen. Mm. Mm. And so there are many repercussions from that speech that people don't realize that happened as a result of. I want to ask you about some of the film work that you did have the ability to do. The Laughing Policeman, 1973. With? Uh, well, the director is Stuart Rosenberg. Right. Mm -hmm. Who had bad migraine headaches, incidentally. Oh, my. Then there's Counselor at Crime. And who was in that Laughing Policeman? Was it Walter Matthau? I'm not sure. I think it was. I don't have was. it written down here. I think it was mm -hmm. Walter Matthau. Okay. And anyway, Walter Math and I became great friends. He was a wonderful, wonderful actor and a wonderful, wonderful man with a great sense of humor. And uh, I don't know, he and I just hit it off. Mm. He was a great, great guy, personally. I mean, he was just really fun to be with. And I'm not sure if he hit it off with everybody, but he was just an all right person. I knew we took lots of pictures together, and he was quite a ham. Very talented person, very talented actor. That's awesome. The next one is Counselor at Crime. 
from 1973, directed by Alberto De Martino. Oh my gosh, that was a group of Italians. And you know what I learned out of that film? Do you know why Italians drive a Ferrari or a Maserati, the fastest cars in the world? No. You have any clue? Mm -mm. Because Italians are always late. <laughs> Oh, goodness. <laughs> That's how this shoot went. Things were late. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it was really fun working with Italians. I mean, my being exotic really paid off in Italian films. You know, they loved me. They wanted me to go to Italy. I mean, it was really, it was really a great experience. Wow. The Trial of Billy Jack, 1974. Now that was an experience. Tom Laughlin, who played the part of Billy Jack, was the all-time independent filmmaker. He was a maverick unto himself. And Tom Laughlin lived on diet soda. I don't know if he ever ate a regular meal. And he used to blow up regularly on the set. And you never knew when he was going to go off like a stick of dynamite. I think it really it was his nutritional program. <laughs> well, you're a nutritionist, so you know. <laughs> well, yeah. He really... <laughs> and... I used to go, well, there she blows, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And you just never knew who he was going to blow up at. And it was just amazing. But all around, he was an okay guy. Um, and he invented the uh, four-walling of films. And he made lots of money on the Billy Jack films. It was the first time that he portrayed a native uh, person who was a karate expert. And that's when I became friends with Bon Su Han, who was a karate expert, who was the karate expert on the film, who did all of the karate stunts in in the movie itself he was a master he was an absolute genius and I really admired him tenfold and that's when I met of course other Native Americans and we shot in Indian country and Tom Laughlin really did take a chance on me he knew I had been red listed in the industry and he hired me anyway. Mm. I didn't have a lot of big parts in that film, but I did have part in that movie. Where would you say that film falls in terms of representing Native Americans on film? Because it well, seems quite unusual say, for the time. Yeah, it was unusual for the time. It was. And there were other Indians that I met in there. George Aguilar who is Yaki and was from Tucson, Arizona. And he went on to do a wonderful film that I love to this day called Baghdad Cafe. I don't know if you remember it, oh, but yes. it was classic. And I'm still friends to this day with George. And there were other native people there as well, like Gus Gray Mountain, he's Navajo. He was in the film. I'm trying to recall some of the others. Thank you. Whose names don't come to me as easily. Now I'm 75 years old. I don't know what comes easily these days. But anyway, it, we had our great times out there in Indian country on the reservation. I knew Tom Laughlin gave us his limousine one time. And we were so embarrassed to be in a limousine in Indian country I mean, to be in a pickup truck is great, but to be in a limousine among our own people, that was embarrassing. We don't want to be in a limousine. And Tom Laughlin thought he was doing us this great favor. 
Not. <laughs> That's funny. It is, isn't it? It is, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, there were some some great times on, on that particular film. Do you recall anything about Freebie and the Bean? Yes, I do, because I met a member of the Mafia family, uh, the Gallo family. And the Gallo family was a group of Mafia uh, men who were involved in Jimmy Breslin's movie, The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight, in New York. And that particular family that was a Mafia family uh, was one that Robert Kennedy was involved in, in getting rid of. And what was unusual about the Gallo brothers in New York was that they used to torture their victims with a lion that they had uh, that lived in a den uh, in a basement and to get their victims to talk. So I guess if they wanted somebody to talk, they had this big lion down there. You either talk or get eaten by the lion. I don't know. But anyway, I worked with their first cousin on that particular film. And he used to tell me all sorts of stories about his first cousins, the Gallo brothers, who were the gangsters. And I said, the Gallows? I said, aren't you from a mobster family? D didn't didn't Jim, Jimmy Breslin write a book about your family, the gang that couldn't shoot straight? And this guy named Gallo said, honey, I'm the actor. I'm not the mobster. <laughs> he had this New York accent. And we started laughing. And we became instant friends. And he used to tell me all sorts of stories about his crazy cousins. And it was a riot. I never met anybody more hilarious in my whole life. So I have some good memories. <laughs> oh my goodness. And that was set in San Francisco. That was set in San Francisco. And then there is Winterhawk. Oh, Winterhawk. That's where I met a real pal named Woody Strode. Woody was an athlete who was a major league football player, and he was way like myself before his time. And he was the inspiration behind Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali really loved Woody Strode. And because Woody was just a first class athlete, and that's what Muhammad Ali wanted to be. And Muhammad Ali used to visit Woody Strode at his home all the time in L.A. And I know because I was there at Woody's house. And my girlfriend, Apua, was Woody Strode's uncle. And Apua and I are still friends to this day. She's native Hawaiian Hawaiian. In fact, I call her Apui Momo. And she calls me Sachi Momo. Uh, <laughs> wait, so she was Woody Strode's aunt? Uh, Apua's uh, aunt was married to Woody Strode. I see. And uh, Apua's aunt used to be the stand-in for Dorothy L'Amour. It, it's all so insidious, isn't it? <laughs> all these stories. It's incredible. And I always used to spend Thanksgiving with Apua, her aunt, who was married to Woody Strode, down at Woody Strode's house in L.A. And the craziest thing is, is when Apua's mother used to come from Hawaii and rent a station wagon and bring a pig over, a roasted pig from Hawaii, <laughs> I said, Apua, how did your mother... Get a roasted pig in the plane, first of all. And how does she put it in a rent-a-car 
and get it down here to L.A., for God's sake, in time for Thanksgiving. <laughs> I mean, we used to have luau Thanksgivings, and everybody would do the hula and the Tahitian dances and all of this sort of thing. I mean, if you could imagine all of this going on for Thanksgiving dinner, I mean, it was a riot. We used to have some good times. <laughs> Oh, that's incredible. Anything but boring. <laughs> not boring. That's not the boring. Theme. Not boring. That's your life theme. <laughs> not boring. Do you remember her aunt's name? Oh, no. You know, we'll I I up. don't I don't recall her name. Uh-huh. But she had dementia in her later years. And when we had parties, we used to play Hawaiian music. And she would come out of her bedroom. And she would dance the most incredible hula that you have ever seen in your entire life. It was absolutely beautiful. She didn't miss a step. She remembered every little step of the hula. And then the song would end, and she'd be confused, and Woody would lead her back to her bedroom. And I said, wow, that was quite a performance that your aunt put on. I said, that was unbelievable. She said, yes, my aunt never forgot a dance. It was amazing. Extraordinary. Yeah. It was extraordinary. Mm. Oh, I've seen some extraordinary <laughs> things. <laughs> and remember, Woody played Sergeant Rutledge. And was directed by John Ford in that starring role. Mm -hmm. And he also starred in Spartacus fighting in the gladiator scene with Kirk Douglas. And that was directed by, and I'm trying to think of his name. Kubrick. Yes. Uh, Stanley Kubrick directed Spartacus. Um, I believe you're right. But it was written by... Yeah, Dalton Trumbo. Bingo! Mm -hmm. You get the prize, as we say in the Indian (laughs) world. Mm -hmm. Dalton Trumbo. And Dalton Trumbo was totally uh, uh, snubbed by John Wayne when he won the Academy Award for writing Spartacus after he was blackballed in the McCarthy era. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yes. And Dalton Trumbo was a person that John Wayne hated. John Wayne hated me. And John Wayne also hated the first black man athlete who won the Olympics in Germany. And when Jesse Owen came back to the United States with his Olympic medal, he had to go in the back door of this Hollywood uh, big party. And John Wayne refused to shake his hand because he was black. So with those three people, myself included, together, I think I'm in great company. I have one more film I want to ask you about, and that's Shoot the Sun Down. Oh, yes. Directed by David Leeds. Right, exactly. Margot Kidder was a very sweet woman. She went on to play Superman's love interest. (laughs) Lois Lane, right? Yeah, Lois Lane. But she was a very sweet lady, Margot Kidder. She was very sweet. And she also suffered from bipolar uh, disorder. Mm -hmm. And she also used to speak for NAMI, National Alliance of the Mentally Ill. That's how I met her on another level. So that was very interesting that we would meet in film and then also meet through National Alliance of the Mentally Ill when we were both promoting uh mental health which is very interesting 
and Christopher Walken, who went on to do film and more television and more plays and so on and so forth. He was a very nice man. He was a very, very nice man. And of course, I think I got killed off in that film. You know, I was always getting killed off in these films. There was just no justification for it, mm -hmm. as I recall. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I also want to go back into time, back into history. I won this contest called Miss Vampire of America. That was way before Marlon Brando. And I was supposed to get a part on Dark Shadows. And that was a television series at that time with Barnaby the Vampire, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, that led to other walk-on roles and a trip to New York. And they put me on the To Tell the Truth show. And that was with Gary Moore as the host. And that was at the time when Kitty Carlisle was on the show with Bill Cullen. I don't know if your memory goes back that far. And some of the oldies but goodies in New York. I wish I had footage of that. We have to look for it. Boy, I was really, really young in those days. Really, really young. And uh, back in those days is when I met Lana Turner. Because I they gave us all a free trip to Disneyland. And that, of course, is in Southern California. And uh, I was at a nightclub where all of us girls snuck out because we were supposed to be with um, chaperones, but we wanted to go out and dance. So we did at this uh, Beverly Hills Club or something. And that's where Lana Turner came up to me and introduced herself and told me that I danced very well and that I was very attractive, and I thanked her. And uh, I thought it was really wonderful that a major motion picture star like her would compliment me. She was a very nice, nice lady. Can you go back to the vampire contest? The vampire contest? <laughs> yes. Well, it was my girlfriend, Sherry Nordwall, who was Adam Fortunate Eagle's daughter. And she encouraged me because she found this ad from MGM to enter the Miss Vampire contest. And she said, oh, come on, Sash, we can make you up as a vampire. You've got to enter this contest. So she and several other Indian girls dressed me all up and put the makeup on and all this sort of thing. So I went and I entered this big contest in San Francisco sponsored by MGM, and I won. And then I went to another contest, and I won the Miss National Vampire Contest. It was all a big spoof. <laughs> I mean, it was, wasn't to be taken seriously. And then the winner was supposed to get this part in this Dark Shadows, which was a popular television series, daytime soap at that time. And then that led to other things and other things and other things. And that's basically how I got my start. Mm. I mean, it wasn't something to be taken seriously <laughs> initially at all. About how old were you? It was, I think, right after Alcatraz. So it was before Marlon Brando, way before Marlon mm -hmm. Brando. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And before my time in radio, when I worked at KFRC, the Big 610, as a public service director. Mm. Got it. And before I became a stringer at KQED PBS television in uh, newscasting. Yeah, it was way before then as well. Mm -hmm. I've dabbled in a little bit of everything. You certainly have. And in dance also. Yes, so exactly. Could you talk about the ballet project that you were part of? Yeah, after Alcatraz, it's not that you were on the island at any point is what did you do with 
the experience that you had or were inspired to do with Alcatraz. Uh, for me, I think that it's important to understand that a lot of us were urban Indian people and we wanted to get back to our roots because we were urban natives and we didn't know a whole bunch about our being native. And there were a lot of Indians there from all over the United States, Canada and New Zealand and Australia and so forth and so on, Aboriginal peoples. So we got an opportunity uh, to meet and greet elders. And I met with Hopi elders and with Comanche elders and with Navajo elders, Apache elders, uh, Mohawk elders, and Akwesasne elders, and both men and women. And they took a young group of us into these wilderness campouts, uh, and we did sweat lodge ceremonies women with women, guys with guys. And they taught us songs. They taught us dances. Uh, they talked to us about being the first ecologist of the land, the first environmentalist of the land, what that meant. They talked to us about old-time philosophies and everything that we were craving to know about as Native young people. And it was a wonderful experience, just beautiful. And uh, it was a different type of education that the white curriculum had never offered to us as Native Indian people. And it was a chance to touch ourselves because there was not that type of learning available. And we did. And for me, it was just heaven sent. And for other Native people, it was heaven sent. So uh, we really uh, got an opportunity to express ourselves in that way. We had never had that before. And after uh, that experience, uh, the occupation lasted about 18 months. Uh, Alcatraz was negotiated by... A, a woman who was studied to be an attorney, and I'm trying to think of her father's name, Jim Thorpe, Grace Thorpe, was studying to be an attorney, and she negotiated Alcatraz for more than 200 acres of land up in Davis, California, to become a two-year junior college called the Gundawita Quetzalcoatl University, otherwise known as DQU. And uh, it became a Native American two-year accredited junior college. And after, uh, it welcomed and opened to anyone. And after you graduated from that school, you went on to the four-year UC Davis University and graduated from there. And I became a teacher at DQU University up in Davis, California. And I taught Native American nutrition and herbology up there. So that's how I'm affiliated with that. Mm -hmm. After Alcatraz, it continued for years and years and years. And it was uh, started by Dave Risling, who is a Hoopa California Indian, uh, and also Dr. Jack Forbes, who was a teacher at UC Davis. And it was fully accredited. So that was a good deal for Native peoples everywhere. I became involved in the Song for a Dead Warrior through Michael Smoon, who is the director, and Lou Christensen, who was the director of the San Francisco Ballet Company. And they were doing an experimental ballet called Song for a Dead Warrior based loosely on the life of Richard Oakes, who was the original spokesperson 
for Alcatraz Island and the occupation. And um, I came on board as the one of the dance consultants for the project itself with my friend Jasper Redrobe, who was Northern Cheyenne from Montana. And we were the two that stayed with that project for five years. And that ballet became an Emmy Award ballet shown on PBS nationally and made it to the Kennedy Center for a congressional viewing there. And Joanne Woodard, who is the wife of Paul Newman, she went with us and she viewed it and she cried when she saw it. And she said to me and Michael Smuin, this is not a ballet, this is real life. And she cried and she was so touched by it. And this ballet traveled around the world, around the globe for five years and it got accolades everywhere that it traveled. Mm. And it was a wonderful, wonderful ballet. And uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful project to work on for that many years. Don't ask me why, but I was very good friends with Casper Weinberger Jr., who was the son of the Secretary of State for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> he was my buddy and my friend. Talk about the liberal and the conservative. <laughs> And he saw the ballet as well. And he loved it. He really loved it. But when I was talking to his father at their home in Hillsboro, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Casper Weinberger himself, and I was oftentimes their dinner guest down there, it was a very palatial place, you know, uh, and all, which was... You know, a bit different for me because I, I come from the poor folks, you know, uh, going into this kind of opulence. And Casper Weinberger Sr. comes in, and I'm in the library, and we're sitting there, we're having this conversation, and I know he's a conservative, and I'm not. So we're sitting there, and I said, well, sir, I know you're a conservative. And he said, yes. And I said, well, conservative means to conserve what is. And I said, I come from poverty. I come from a place of tuberculosis. I said, a place of abuse and a place of racism and a place of alcoholism. And I said, I don't want to conserve any of that. And I wanted change to come so that I could become and I could be. So naturally, you can understand why I'm not a conservative. And he said, I can see your point. <laughs> wow. And that was the beginning of our conversation. And we got along like two peas in the pod. <laughs> well, you laid it all out there from the beginning. I did. Mm -hmm. Exactly that. Told them who you are. I really did. And I've never told that story before. Mm. I've never told that story before. I didn't see why we shouldn't get along just because we're opposites, mm -hmm. you know. And it was amazing. Mm. It was amazing. Wow. And then I went on to work with Neil Diamond in uh, Canada. In fact, he came knocking at my door. He was a total stranger to me, although he was a Native American. From Canada, the Indian, not the, the singer. And he asked me to participate in his film about stereotypes. And I said, gladly, I said, if you include my friend Russell Means of the American Indian Movement, who had become an actor, John Trudell, who was a performer and a singer and also an activist, my friend Melinda Miko, 
who is a professor of Native Studies at Mills College, and also Charlie Hill, who is Oneida, and our first Native American Indian comedian. I would participate in his film, Real Engine, R-E-E-L, Engine, I-N-J-U-N. And we all are in the movie, a one-hour documentary, the first of its kind about the stereotype of Native American Indians in film, television, and sports. And I think it's a beautiful film, well done, and all of us in it who are Native, including Robbie Robertson of the band. It's a wonderful film. It is. I'm very proud of it. And it, it won the Peabody Awards. So I'm very happy about that. Have you heard people talk about the impact of that film on their understanding of issues of the representation of Native people on screen? I've heard some, but of course not all. Can't be all places, all things to all people. Mm -hmm. But if you have feedback, I'd love to hear it. We featured in the museum, at the Academy Museum, because Wonderful. it encapsulates the issue so well, and it's spoken from the perspective of yes. Native people. Spoken from the original Native people, from our point of view, written by, spoken by, is by Native American people. And that's what I love about it. And that's why I love participating in it. And I also made and participated in my own documentary called Sasheen Breaking the Silence after 45 years of being silenced. And part of our, how racism works against us is that we can't speak for ourselves. We are silenced. And so being able to speak up is breaking through the racism. So having a voice. And so breaking the silence is part of breaking through the racism itself after 45 years. And it has been an award-winning documentary. And participating with the San Francisco Indian Film Festival with Mike Smith has always been a pleasure and a joy in promoting Indians in film. And they did award me with the, uh, the Spirit Award of the San Francisco Film Festival, the Indian Film Festival, which I was totally shocked. After 40 years, they gave me this big award, and I got a standing ovation when I went there. And I talked about the gratitude that I have after 40 years of pushing and working within the Native community and all of the things that I'm grateful for and have been grateful for in my life. Mm. And it, it was a wonderful feeling to be supported by my own people. And when I went down to Beverly Hills to the Red Nations Film Festival, I received the Marlon Brando Award by his daughter, Rebecca Brando, and that was another feeling of camaraderie that we had together. Marlon's gone now, but she and I had a tremendous camaraderie. And it was also beautiful to note that she told me and his secretary told me that he kept every letter that I've ever written to him, and it's in his archives. And I never knew that, never. And they gave me copies of all of his letters of mine that he kept. And I reread them after more than 45 years. And that was really a momentous event. What did you think when you reread them? 
I sat down and I said, my. It meant this much to him that he kept them. It's truly amazing. Mm -hmm. After all these years and all these tears, to look at these letters once again, dated, you know, so far back. And um, that the documentary did so well and won so many awards, including at the San Francisco Indian Film Festival, the Red Nations Indian Film Festival, the Pocahontas Indian Film Festival back east in the, in the East Coast, and um, overseas in Europe, where it showed in Germany and England and France, etc., and uh, other places back east, and the Beverly Hills Film Festival at one first place in the short documentary category. So I was really amazed. It was only 27 minutes of film, but it was a good one. So I was truly taken back. And now at this point in my life, when I was called upon to be a keynote speaker and I brought a catalog from the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museums that was held at the Pachanga Indian Reservation down south from 2019. And the opening keynote speaker was Joy Harjo, poet laureate, I guess that's how you pronounce mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I was the keynote speaker for the closing ceremony. And I received three closing uh, standing ovations there when I gave my closing talk. And it's something that's very near and dear to me because I'm a breast cancer patient mm -hmm. still to this day. And that's another subject, because we're looking at death. Mm -hmm. And death is a great teacher, tremendous teacher. And, um, you know, people, they don't think about death. This culture doesn't think about death. They close it off in their minds. It's never going to happen to me. It's going to happen to somebody else, but not me. So they don't prepare themselves. I have a end-of-life doctor, an end-of-life nurse, an end-of-life social worker. <laughs> a team. A team of people that are helping me now, getting my act together now with an advanced care health directive as we speak. And my power of attorney now, and my funeral plans now. And Dr. Biddle, who's my doctor uh, with my oncologist, told me, get your act together now while you can still function. I don't have any patients that have regretted doing it now but I have patients who have regretted not doing it now when they're too sick to do it. So get it done now. Don't wait until you're too sick to do it. And he's absolutely correct. So my niece Kalina and I are doing it together now while I'm still able to function. And it's been a relief because I lost my husband a little over six months ago from an incurable cancer. And he didn't have to, it together at all. And I took care of him 24 seven for more than six months as his main support person. And when it came down the pike, wow, what an overload of work. I did his income taxes after he passed away. April 15, they were due. 
and it took more than 25 hours of paperwork to put all that together with a tax person to get it in on time. Death and taxes are a sure thing, let me tell you. Also, I just got the funeral bill paid off two weeks ago. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. So it's very important to get these things handled way in advance for everybody. Not just myself, but everyone. And um, I'm learning a great lesson here. I didn't know. I never did. I'm looking over the Grand Canyon of my life, seeing everything that I have done since I was very small, and looking at it now, and it's coming closer and closer and closer. And I'm saying to myself, I'm not afraid of death but I am afraid of the suffering and the pain. And I would be a fool not to be. But I am learning how to live with it because I know I have to go through this hula hoop to get to the other side. But I know that Charles is waiting for me there. I know that he's with me right now as we speak here and I've got good company with him. And I know that I'm going back to the land of my ancestors. I know that I'm going to be with the Creator. And I know that they're all going to throw a big celebration to me when I cross over to the spirit world. We're all going to have a big party. And I know it's going to be a very joyful event when I leave here. And so it's not all going to be sad and gloomy, but it's going to be another transition. And that I know for sure, because I was with Charles. And I know. So, you know, as I make, make preparations, uh, I have a good attitude, a positive attitude. And uh, I know a lot of people, they sort of cry and they go through all of this, you know, emotion about woe is me and blah, 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 blah. But it's not really like that. There's a whole another way of looking at it. You know, in a more positive frame, with a more positive outlook. And it can be very joyful of looking at yourself and others, a way of saying hello and giving things away. I gave my car away already. I gave Charles' car away already. I'm giving material things away already. I'm not going to be taking it with me, I guarantee you. <laughs> No, you can't. No, I'm not even going to take this body with me when I go. I'm going to leave it behind because mm. my spirit is going to travel onward. And, you know, it's a freeing feeling, really, mm. because people here become attached to materialism. There's the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. We come into this world from the spirit world, and we're going home to the spirit world. We're not going to take the physical part with us. No matter how much money you accrue on this earth, no matter who you cheated, stole from, or whatever, all of that is going to be for naught. I know that for a fact. And let go of all that crap. It's not useful. Never was useful, never will be useful. The only thing that matters is letting go. The truth be known. The spirit be clean. Clean machine. Mm -hmm. Only that can enter the spirit world. You know, people are so me, myself, and I oriented. It's we, us, and our. 
I know that for a fact, Jack. And all the nuances of truth come to you as you're letting go. It's just amazing what a learning experience that death is. It's just amazing. I'm in a whole new learning curve, Jacqueline. Wow. Whole new learning curve. And it's better than college. But there is no degree. There is no degree. I told Kalina, all of these things are going to be yours when I go. And we'll sit down and we'll make a list about who gets what where. So nobody's going to be fighting over anything. It'll all be done. And I've started to also just give things away. You know, because that's the way I want it. That's the way I want it. It's the big giveaway. I think Native people, we have ceremonies called the giveaway. When you're a head woman dancer and you're honored in that way, you have a giveaway. So you give to all the head staff, the MC, the other head dancers, the arena director, and also the head gourd dancer at the powwow. And then you give to other elders in the community and other friends in the community. So when you're honored, you give. And it's a lesson for life. So the person who is honored is the person who does the giving. And it's not that way in the dominant society. But this is a learning lesson for life, is a great giveaway. And it's a preparation for death, to give away, to give away. And it's a beautiful thing to do. Beautiful thing to do and learn. So I know you have some additional things that you want to share with us, some of your writings. Yes, I do. Um, one of them is about a ceremony that was held for me when I first got breast cancer. My oncologist said to me, um, after my two surgeries and treatment, that uh, I was her rock star patient, that I had lasted more than the time that I was given. And she thought that was absolutely amazing. And um, I guess it is, but I owe tribute to the ceremonies that I've been in, the traditional Native ceremonies. So I wrote this in tribute to one of them. The night is a time when ceremonies are held. How many times have I sat in the complete blackness and darkness of ceremonies with the medicine man praying and see the spirit lights flicker about a completely pitch black room? There is no time, only the moment. There are no faces, only one force, those prayers that belong to the Creator prayed in our language and sung in our language of times of old, revived today in the present. Times when my ancestors prayed with this medicine and sang these songs in this sacred way. The medicine na man named Richard Moveskamp, who afterwards showed me an old photograph of his ancestors, told me in private, it is good, he said, you are to be well. As he had said that my prayers and all those who prayed for me had been heard. And then he told me something special. My ancestors know who you are, he told me. I understood in my heart exactly what this meant and savored this ancestral experience. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. I wrote that right after that ceremony had taken place. I also wrote about the refusal of the Academy Award, and I did this in one setting. 
1973, as a young Indigenous woman in front of a hostile, dominant society audience, I took center stage, refusing the Academy Award statue on behalf of Marlon Brando to bring awareness to the negative Native American Indian people by the film, television, and sports industry. I highlighted the 73 American Indian Movement occupation of Wounded Knee, South Dakota. They were experiencing a media blackout. Supposedly, Wounded Knee, South Dakota was a site where a U.S. missile base was going to be built. I, more than anyone, know the impact of what 60 seconds at the Academy Awards can mean then and now, 50 years later. I have developed a strong sense of self and a good sense of humor. Laughter is good medicine. I come from an ancestral matrilineal society where women are leaders, role models, and teachers of peace, love, harmony, justice, humanity, truth, conversation, and a coming together in a sacred circle of unity. Mm. In the path of our ancestors, I remain Sasheen Littlefeather. It's beautiful. You've read many amazing things. I think that's my favorite one. Just amazing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Sashin, what does it mean to you to be talking about all of this today and also to know that your speech is part of a, a museum exhibition on the history of the Academy Awards? It feels like the sacred circle is completing itself before I go in this life. It feels like a big cleanse, if you will, of mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm and of heart. It feels that the truth be known. And it feels like the creator's being good to me. And it feels like Charles, Mr. Charles Kashaway is here by my side to witness it all with me. He and I both be native, have seen life through the same lens. And now of the same heart and mind that we're experiencing this together. And it feels good. It feels good. It's more than I could ever hope for. You know, prayers are sometimes answered, sometimes not. But it feels good. It feels good in my heart. And thank you to all for making this possible. Thank you to everyone. Thanks to you, Jacqueline. Thanks to all the people on the staff and the camera and the sound and the help here, and thanks to everyone at the Academy. Thanks to Bird Running Water. Thanks to Heather Ray. Thanks to all the people who believed in me. Thanks to my niece, Kalina. I want her to say a few words as a young person that I may have influenced her in some way. And I thank the Creator. I have a lot of gratitude that prayers are answered after all these years. Yep, after all these years and all these tears, finally. Mm. We all owe you a tremendous thanks, Sashin, for your generosity of time and spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Sashin, who is this? Who do we have here? This is Kalina Lawrence, and she is my adopted niece. She's from the Squamish Indian tribe up in the state of Washington. And she is a res girl. <laughs> How did you meet? Well, I had the great honor and privilege of being invited to the 2018 Golden Globe Awards with my dear friend, Shailene Woodley, who is also an actor. And we were invited in solidarity with the Time's Up initiative. And I went as a representative of missing and murdered indigenous women 
of uh, Coast Salish peoples and to identify that indigenous and native women have also been doing this work to end violence, to end murder, to end sexual assault in our communities. And that action, the idea of using that platform for this action, for this awareness, for this initiative was made possible because of the actions that Aunt Sashin took in 1973 and using that platform and collaborating across different walks of life to address the real happenings and the real struggles that people have been going through for generations. And we, at the time in that year, were also working in our communities to promote Sashin's documentary and to share her story and to highlight and to thank her for her sacrifice, for her wisdom, for her courage, for her representation on an international scale. And for me, I was 24 at the time that I had participated in that action and knowing her story and learning from my parents and my community members about her lasting impact made the connection that much stronger and made it important for me to acknowledge that. So she and I were connected um, shortly after that experience and the first time that we met she had shared with me about this documentary on one of her good friends, Bruce Miller, who is Skokomish up from the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about this story of his life and his teachings and his legacy called Teachings of the Tree People. While we were sitting in her living room, I let her know that I was in that documentary when I was in fifth grade. <laughs> And uh, it was a really special moment because we had realized that while the actions that we both took, you know, 45 years apart, um, we also had intercommunal connections within our communities and our ancestors and our loved ones and our teachers. And uh, it was a really special moment. In addition to watching her documentary, I got to say, hey, that's a photo of my dad in your documentary. And his name was John Vigil, a.k.a. John Chiquiti, and he was at Wounded Knee. And my mom, my birth mom, was also at Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. And then, and my father, my stepfather, if you will, was on Alcatraz. And they were in a lot of the same spaces as student activists and artists. And as um, engaged members of this kind of national movement, this international movement. And so I got to watch her documentary and say, mm -hmm. hey, that's my dad. And she said, you're kidding. That's, that's your dad? That's John Chiquiti. Yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> and the familial connections that we had were established before we were even introduced in person. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes, I knew her dad from way back when. On Alcatraz, Wounded Knee, all this sort of thing. The interconnections weave way back when. Mm -hmm. It yeah. seems like you were destined to meet one another. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Joey Montoya and I had been um, similarly using whatever avenues we could to uh, address, to reduce, to combat the circumstances of urban natives and natives on reservations and everywhere. Everywhere that we exist, there are lasting impacts of assimilation and oppression, colonization and colonialism, 
And if it were not for the work of those who came before us, we could not and would not do what we do, or at least it wouldn't be as quote unquote easy <laughs> um, with without their sacrifices. And Joey Montoya and myself had wanted to make sure to acknowledge and by protocol show respect and gratitude in the ways that our culture teaches us to honor our elders, to to uh, continue on the work in the best ways that we know how, knowing we might make mistakes, but knowing that the courage is is forever present and that we can tap into it. And Aunt Sashin and Uncle Charles welcomed us uh, into their homes, into their two homes <laughs> that they've had ever since. And, uh, and in a lot of indigenous ways, um, you know, there is a cultural adoption process that is very sacred, that is not to be taken lightly. And uh, for Aunt Sashin and Uncle Charles to offer themselves uh, to become chosen family and uh, mm -hmm. to have such a profound part in my life has been really a blessing. And as we have gotten to know more about each other's life stories, we really are identifying there are a lot of parallels. And the first time that we had a conversation, I got to share my music with her. I got to show her my music videos. I got to talk to her about my artistic process and what it's been like for me as an independent contemporary native artist. And in that conversation, she looked at me and said, you are my dream come true. You are my literal dream come true. The path that you're on, your career, your work, that is why I did what I did. And that's why I continue to do what I do. And that was our very first conversation. And she's told you all about these incredible connections where she'll meet someone right off the bat and it's instantaneous how profoundly she can impact someone's life in a couple of sentences. <laughs> and I just felt very similarly to be uh, on the receiving end of that in our first time sharing space together it feels like there's uh, there's alignment that may be beyond our knowing, but for whatever reason, we took it and we ran with it. And, uh, and moving away from the res and coming here to an urban setting was very different for me. But I also learned through her and Mr. Charles and I... Um, that the spirit that you hold and the teachings that you hold and the families that you come from are with you no matter where you live. And um, you all have probably felt by walking into this space how safe and protected and peaceful and loving they have created it. And it makes me feel like my family would make me feel at home. And I know a lot of that is because she also spent a lot of time in my community, in my hometown, and and uh, and doing a lot of the a lot of the natural things that I did as a young woman in response to the circumstances that we are living in the society, and figuring out whatever ways that we can to to offer compassion and courage where the opposite is existing. And uh, wow, it's been a journey. <laughs> it's been yeah, a journey. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. Sashin held 
does this make you feel? You, she said, you said that she was your dream come true. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, when I was um, up there refusing the award, I dreamed about someone like Kalina and someone who would break through the barriers and do her own thing where the doors would be open and where she would be able to go through them to be able to make her dreams come true of singing, of acting, of doing. And uh, years ago, when I was a member of the uh, Indian acting group, Red Earth, which was one of the first Native American Indian uh, performing companies in the United States, uh, up in Washington State in Seattle, to be exact, uh, I met members of her tribe, the Suquamish Indian tribe, and Granny Hilaire was our mentor, and she was 100 years old. And she had been married to seven hereditary chiefs and outlived them all. And no performance was ever complete without our elder Granny Hilaire being there. And Bruce, who she mentioned, who is also known as Baush, um, he wrote our plays, our traditional plays, and we performed in a big long house up there in Seattle. And uh, one night after not uh, seeing him for a few years, in the middle of the night, I decided to turn on PBS television and watch it for some odd reason. And there was Baush on the television. There was a documentary about him and his life. And I thought, oh, how fortunate I am to see him on the screen because my heart had been aching to give him a call. And I thought, how fortunate. I'll give him a call in the morning, you know. And there was all of the Suquamish, you know, land and beauty with the ocean and everything like that. And he was speaking and he was talking about Red Earth Theater Company in the old days and all of this and that, you know. And I said, how wonderful. And uh, toward the end of the show on PBS, which was a half an hour production, it said, in memory of Bausch. And I thought, oh my God, his spirit was calling me to watch this. He wanted me to see him. And his spirit was calling out to me in the middle of the night because he knew that I was thinking of him. And he wanted me to know. And I didn't know that he had passed on. I didn't know that he had died. And he was already in the spirit world. And so in the middle of the night, I found out and uh, I will never forget that, never forget that. And then here Kalina came to me from the land of Granny Hilaire, from the land of Baush, and she came into my life and she made it whole and complete. And here I am in the past and she is the future. And here she is in the present. And this is what I did what I did. She is the beginning of a whole new agenda. And so I pass the baton on to her. And I do it gratefully and thankfully. This is what I did for, is for her and for Joey Montoya, who is from the Lipon Apache Reservation in Texas. This is what I did this for, so that she can be, she can become, that the doors are open for her. This is what makes my heart happy. That's so fortunate. Yeah, I love her. And so is the I love world. You. <laughs> <laughs> when I smile, when I see her smile, it makes me smile inside too. Mm. Makes me happy. Yeah. I'm leaving and she's just beginning. 
happy road. She can sing, too. <laughs> she sings like a bird. I was waiting for that. I'm going to ask her to sing something of her choice. Uh, this is the most notice she's given me, by the way. Yeah, really, instant like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we do it. The song that I want to share is one that comes from uh, Stolo territory from Chilliwack, British Columbia, and it's one that we have been singing throughout these last couple of years and the highs and the lows of life and everything we've been through. It's carried by Junior James and it's it's one that we hope just honors and holds prayer for everyone on this roller coaster. Uh, it's called Roller Coastal because we're coastal. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a song that I turn to for grounding and for strength and for joy and for sorrow and for everything. And uh, I want to offer this to, to you, Auntie, for like making this ride so fun and <laughs> all of your humor and all of your wisdom and um, your just everything you've done during your time here and the time we still have together and yeah so this one is for you <laughs> <clears throat> oh hey hi oh hi oh hey oh hey Roller coaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 
beautiful and so grounding, like you said. Mm. So grounding, even though we're way up here and way down yeah. there, that we see all over like the place. Life. I want you to say a few words about the film, the TV, that mm. you worked on as an advisor. Mm. Ooh. And thank you for the beautiful song. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, well, there have been Native, Indigenous, Afro-Indigenous, multi-racial Indigenous peoples in this industry, I'm sure since its inception, and especially since Aunt Sasheen and others had worked on affirmative action, had paved the way, and had expressed the the margins that exist in representation. And as the decades have gone on, more and more people in this industry, in this community have not only created paths and have followed their dreams, but have thought of others, have brought others along with them. And I say that because when you're thought of in a room where decisions are being made, where ideas are being presented, it can make a huge difference. It can change the course. It can change the direction of any idea, of any creation. And in 2020, 2021, the barrier of location and separation seemed to be dwindling because of social media, because we could locate someone through their profiles and their emails, and we could learn about them because of the Black Lives Matter movement and the demand for more inclusion, for more collaboration, people really wanted to learn and to know and to try better, and to try harder, to be more intentional. And uh, thankfully for um, access through social media, I had checked my Instagram one day <laughs> And I had a message from Sydney Freeland, who is an incredible director and also indigenous and uh, Diné. And uh, this message from Sydney was, hey, I have previously worked on the show Grey's Anatomy and there are some wonderful writers in the writer's room who have an idea about an episode that would feature Suquamish characters for the first time in all 17 seasons of Grey's Anatomy, which is based in traditional Suquamish, Duwamish, Coast Salish territory and the city of Seattle. And for the first time, uh, they wanted to have an entire storyline based on a Suquamish family. And then a step further, how do we be more inclusive, right? How do we bring people in who have this cultural knowledge uh, rather than making assumptions or basing off stereotypes or that limited information? So when Sydney had messaged me, she had mentioned that my name was given to her by her friend Julian Brave Noise Cat, who also is <laughs> someone we have been both connected with for quite some time, which I know is his not, mother, <laughs> which is not a surprise at all. But uh, Julian, um, they had reached out to Julian. Do you know any Suquamish people? Julian told Sydney, "Hey, reach out to Kalina." Uh, so I responded to Sydney and said, "I'm interested to hear more." to learn more, um, and was able to be connected with Jess Righthand, who is one of, who was the writer, the main writer on episode 15 of season 17 um, last year. And originally, 
you know, the idea was, hey, can I consult with you in a phone call about our storyline and maybe ask a couple questions? And the phone call happened with Jess and I gave my input and I recommended some changes graciously and uh, and had shared, you know, we've got to do this to the best of our ability for the first time the right way. And, uh, and of course, Jess and the whole team down there were in total agreement. Well, the phone call said, well, can I actually, can, can you help us with the script? Would that be okay? So I looked over the script and also graciously added some recommendations <laughs> and some changes uh, to make it more realistic and more representative of Suquamish, of Duwamish, of Coast Salish. Well, then it was, can you get on Zoom and, and talk over with our our costumes and wardrobe team about what what would the characters wear? So I got on a few Zoom meetings and offered my input, and then it was, oh, what are you what are you doing in two weeks? Like, <laughs> uh, I know that we're in a pandemic. You probably haven't left your house yet, but like, can you come? Can you come to Hollywood? Can you come on set? Because that would be great if you could just be on <laughs> on set to help. Of course, you know, uh, I had to like work through the logistics, right? Um, but I was I was thankful and, and honored and I said, yeah, I can make that happen. Um, and uh, there were, uh, you know, a series of things that took place. And eventually I found myself back in Los Angeles um, visiting Tongva territory and uh, working on set of, for two weeks on season 17, episode 15, which was titled Tradition. And there were one, two, three, four Suquamish characters in total in the storyline. The, the actors were all indigenous. They were not Kosalish, but they were in, indigenous actors who were casted and they were all storytellers and um and one of which was Wes Studi, who <laughs> she's also <laughs> been connected with for so long. And everything just seemed to align in that uh things were working out. And I think that that speaks to the power of this art form, the energy, the intention, the creativity, um, the uh, reinvention, if you will, and the continuation of the work that's already taken place. So that episode aired and uh, it was very special. Again, a moment for people from my community, for people from the Tfoshutid speaking tribes and nations and peoples and dialects from northern Tfoshutid and southern Tfoshutid speaking peoples to see stories that they have lived through uh, in a hospital setting where there's, you know, this uh, balance of, of Western Medicaid medicine, of our indigenous wisdoms and teachings and medicines um, coming together in as hopefully the most accurate way we could portray for the first time. Uh, there was one other episode with a Native storyline, um, but that was in season five, and, uh, and it was back then, which was, you know, a little bit different um, for in terms of representation. And um, so I think that the <laughs> the doors that auntie always speaks of that open um the ones that feel in alignment the ones that feel scary the ones that feel tremendously uh nerve-wracking with lots of pressure those are the ones that women like her walk through claw their way through and tear at the hinges after the fact. And, uh, you know, 
that was also as a language student um, who had the opportunity to work on the script, I was able to input some words in our traditional language, our ancestral language, um, and, and find more ways to popularize and normalize our ways of life that have been preserved, that are very much alive, that everyone can benefit from and continue to just be, be creative and use whatever is at our reach uh, in our hearts, in our minds, um, to think of those coming after us. So Auntie and Uncle Charles and I all got to watch that together in the living room last year. Yeah, we sure did. <laughs> that was a very proud moment. Very happy moment indeed. What were some of the reactions in your community to the episode for other people that were watching? Well, it was very similar to this uh, <laughs> this reaction that Auntie had because she couldn't tell anyone, and I couldn't tell anyone a lot about it. I mean, a few people knew what I was doing, but most people had no idea, and most people watch that show very, you know, religiously. <laughs> And for them to just absorb it, you know, without warning or without knowing um, the uh, role that I was able to have there, the joy, the a lot of emotion, uh, a lot of validation, you know, the feeling of being validated of watching everyday shows on TV and almost never seeing a Native character or a Native storyline or what this perspective might be like from mm -hmm. someone in our positions, uh, from our narrative. You know, it um, it's just one way. It's one way that society can work to... Um, to uh, move forward, move beyond this kind of state that we've been living in for the last few centuries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I think the biggest reaction that folks had was to the language, was to the um, regalia, was to the um, the ancestral ways that we have navigated um, health and birth and um, f and family and you know advocacy we are constantly in scenarios where we have to advocate for ourselves or for those that we love and we have to be the educator and the patient at the same time we have to be the educator and the friend the educator and the granddaughter, the educator, and the, you know, we, we rarely get to just be, and we also rarely get to just be in our truth. Uh, as painful as it is, as hard as it might be to hear and digest and live through and experience, um, you know, normalizing that is, is important. And that's something that in Brando's speech, talking about how hard it is to be a child in this world and then how hard it is to be a native child in this world um, and what those lasting impacts have on our psyche and have on our self-esteem and have on our interactions with others who probably have no idea what it's actually like. I think uh, being able to recognize the the influence that the arts that entertainment has mm -hmm. that media has um, and find a way to do it as <laughs> intentionally as possible though we will make mistakes I always would say that but forgive us for our mistakes not if we make them but when we do um, we're doing the best with what we have right now and um, the community response was uh, one that I've been blessed to receive most of my life um, 
which is encouragement and belief and support and faith and a little nudge <laughs> from from anyone who you know who can see that and so here we are you know mm-hmm. but it was uh I'm very very thankful it's hard to say I have not been on the receiving end as much of the dismissal and the um, disrespect that Ansashin has been on and in one way I'm angry that she has in one way I'm thankful that I haven't and that recognizing that correlation for what it is right yes well, that's why you're her dream. Yes, she is my dream come true. I'm very proud of her. Indeed. Thank you so much, Karina, for talking with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very important part Thank of you. your history, Sashin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and your future. Mm-hmm. Yes, Absolutely. Making dreams come true, it is all through you. Yes, indeed it is. And I love you. Uh, love you. Yes, I do. <laughs> I also A-A-O. learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> She'll sing. She has a song for everything and asks me if yeah, exactly. I know it or not. And if I don't, then I've got to look it up on YouTube. So. Or she has to put up with it. 